hasdan ang imahinasyong Filipino. Ang bukal ng pagiging malikain. Ang pagpapahiyag ng mga taong pinagkaisa ng magkakatulad na kasaysayan. At damdamin umaaruga sa pagpapahalaga sa sarili at pagkatao ng mga mamamayan bilang isang bansa. Imahinasyon ang kaluluwa ng kultura at kalinangan ng isang bayan. Ang sigasig na walang gapos at hindi natatakdaan ng panahon o anumang pangyayari. Pinahayaan niya itong mahubog bilang instrumento ng kadakilaan. Iniipon ang mga minimithi ng isang bansa na nagkakaisa at binibigyang kapangyarihan ng kultura at kalinangan. Ang Pambansang Komisyon para sa Kultura at Mga Sining o National Commission for Culture and the Arts ay natatang. Kinikilala bilang institusyon, bilang tagagawa ng mga alitunduhin upang pagkaisahin ang Pambansang Pagsisikap para sa Kultura at Kalinangan. Ang NCCA ay kumikilala sa pananaw na ang kalinangang Pilipino ay bukal na kagalingang pambansa at pandaigil. Kaya nilalayo nitong pangalagaan ang mga pamanang Pilipino. Panatilihin ang mga tradisyon at sikaping isama ito sa kasalukuyang daloy ng kultura. Ipalaganap ang pag-unlad ng kalinangan at ipamahagi ang mga produkto ng kalinangan at kultura sa buong bansa at sa sandiigigan. Nagsimula bilang Presidential Commission for Culture and the Arts, ang NCCA ay naging Pambansang Komisyon sa ilalim ng tanggapan ng Pangulo ng Pilipinas sa pamamagitan ng Republic Act 7356 na nilagdaan noong ikatatlo ng Abril, isang libo siyam na raan at siyam na putlalawa. Bilang pangunahing ahensya ng pamahalaan para sa kultura, pinangangasiwaan at pinagtutugma-tugma nito ang mga gawain ng anin na ahensyang pangkultura na nakaugnay. Thank you.
As we are as we are about to begin a few reminders before we start the program first I would like to seek your cooperation in completing the first of the five episodes for this year's colloquium kindly mute your microphones to avoid interruptions during the program we would also like to inform everyone that all the information gathered during this activity your name email address photo will be shared publicly for the purpose of this colloquium. To get your electronic certificates of participation, you must accomplish the evaluation form at the end of the program, which you will find at the chat box. The link will be posted there. Thank you for your kind cooperation. October is also the National Museums and Galleries Month as well as the Indigenous Peoples Month. And we have a Friday program at three o'clock. This is done every week. It's called Padayon. So please tune in to that program for all the updates and activities that we have in culture and the arts. The, natural, na the National Literature Month is also ongoing and we have upcoming activities, especially this afternoon at one o'clock, please join us for the National Artist for Literature series, Davao Reads Amado Hernandez, uh, hosted by the University of the Philippines, uh, Mindanao. We also have the Timpalak Florentino Hornedo Awarding Ceremony happening on October 16, the Kampong Poblete on November 2020, and we have the uh, launching of the upcoming books, COVID Text Tanaga and the Himati, Ang Sining ng Pakikinig sa Tulang Filipino. May we request everyone to join us in singing our national anthem and then the prayer which will be led by Miss Marie Therese Lopez. Mga kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Ayang magiling, kaya sa sinahanan, alam ng puso, sa hitik mo'y buhay. Upang hinihang, tuyan ka ng magiting, sa mandulupi, di ka pasisigil, sa nagagat tutup sa simoy at sa nangit mo. Thank you. 
ihanda natin ang ating sarili para sa panalangin. O dakilang may likha na may pinagmulan ng hininga ng buhay na nagbibigay ng tunog, liwanag at enerhiya sa kalawakan, naway tanglawan mo ang kabanalan sa aming kalooban nang mapalapit kami sa iyong kalangitan. Manaig sana ang iyong kabutihan sa buong sandibutan at gayon din dito sa lupa. Liyayaan mo kami ng sapat na pagunawa sa bawat araw at palayain sa tankala ang pagkakasala. Gaya na pagpapaubaya namin sa pagkukulang ng iba, naway di kami masilaw sa karangyaang material at sanlaksang tukso. Bagus ay lumaya sa anumang naglalayo sa amin sa tunay namin tungguhin. tunguhin. Mula sa iyo, aming bathala, Diyos, ala, ay nagmumula ang aming sigla, lakas na loob, kayahan sa pagkilos at awiting nagpapaganda sa lahat at nagpapanibago ng buhay sa bawat panahon. Buong pagtitiwala, pananalig at katotohanan ang panunumpa namin ng buong katapat. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to be the host for the National Commission for Culture and the Arts 2020 Research Colloquium Series. I am Hope Saban Panyu, and in, on behalf of the NCCA Technical Working Group for Research, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you. It is a pleasure to meet you all today. And if you are watching this activity online on Facebook and on the NCCA official website, we wish to thank you for your participation. The first colloquium was held on September 17, 2018 at the Leandro Loxin Auditorium of the NCCA building. Then the theme was Salicultura, Scanning the Field of Philippine Literature and Arts Research. This was followed in 2019 by the second colloquium on September 26 at the National Museum of Fine Arts Auditorium with the theme, Philippine Local Studies, State of the Field. This year, we are with you online as the pandemic has limited our, con our mobilities but not our connectivities. We appreciate you taking the time off your busy schedules to join us today as we begin with the first research colloquium series. We hope you will Learn a lot today as we have lined up a lot of activities for a fruitful and engaging discussion on culture and the arts research. To begin this program, I would like to call on the Executive Director of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, Mr. Al Ryan Alejandre, for his opening remarks. A very good morning to everyone and thank you for joining us for the 2020 NCCA Research Colloquium. It gives me a great pleasure to extend to you all a very warm welcome on behalf of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts and I am grateful to see our resource speakers, our research presenters, as well as organizers share their knowledge in the pursuit of intensifying interest and enriching discussion about our nation's culture and arts. At the outset, allow me to state that the Philippine Constitution guarantees its support of arts and letters and the preservation and development of Filipino culture as a means of reinforcing national identity. This general constitutional provision, which can be found in Article 14 of the 1987 Constitution, ensures a secure place for the arts in national life. It also reminds our citizens to nurture and develop their own cultural values. As a primary government arm mandated to promote Filipino culture and the arts, the NCCA leads as the manifestation of that mission, as enshrined in our Constitution. This year's uh, theme, Salicultura Research Methodologies, will focus on how we can nurture further those cultural values. One way is to revisit existing learnings and add new valuable research to the wellspring of Filipino knowledge from new methods and data gathering 
pedagogy to the ethics of research. I believe this discussion will not only fortify our skills and understanding on our culture and arts, but also inspire new researchers who will continue this meaningful and valuable discussion. This discussion, as we expound using our language, is the filament through which the blood of our culture flows. I wish to congratulate the Saab Commission on Cultural Dissemination through its research grant program for the success of the colloquium and wish you all the most pleasant time in learning throughout the series. Maraming salamat at mabuhay po tayong lahat. Thank you, Mr. Al Ryan Alejandre for that encouraging remark and also for stating again the support that NCCA is giving to all our cultural workers and artists. And now it is my pleasure to ask Ms. Corina Ann Olazo, head of the cultural dissemination section, to share with us the rationale and overview of the program and to introduce to us the technical working group for research and the members of the advisory technical working group. The NCCA research program was anchored on its mandate to do research as clearly stated in Republic Act 7356. RA 7356 provides that the NCCA shall encourage and support research of Philippine artistic traditions, which may aid in the creation of contemporary forms. That the Commission shall encourage and support scholarly research and documentation of Philippine cultural traditions, arts, crafts, as well as significant cultural movements, achievements in the literary, visual, performing arts, mass media, as well as the various aspects of Filipino culture. As agreed during the inception of the said program, four member teams shall compose the technical working group with representatives each from the four sub-commissions. Its general functions are initial screening of research proposals submitted to NCCA, including ethics review, identification of priority agenda for research call, and policy recommendation to further enhance the research program. A total of 63 researchers were given funding from 2017 to 2020. Now on its fourth year, the technical working group has already laid down initiatives to do supplemental activities to complete the cycle of education, creation, dissemination, and utilization of research outputs. As an auxiliary activity, colloquia were conducted that provided a platform for research outputs to be disseminated and presented to the public. In 2018, the first colloquium was held at the NCCA Auditorium at the National Museum in 2019 and now for 2020 has migrated to an online platform to ensure that the process of disseminating the outputs will not be put on hold. The program also boasts of the first publication of the Selixic Cultura, the NCCA Research Journal, which fulfills the NCCA's commitment to research in service of its mandate as the country's overall policy making, coordinating, and funding agency for the preservation, development, and promotion of Philippine arts and culture. Magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. It is with great respect that we present to you the technical working group for the term 
2020 to 2022. Dr. Vicente Handa, Commissioner, Subcommission on Cultural Dissemination and Head of the Technical Working Group. Dr. Felipe De Leon, Jr., representing Subcommission on the Arts and Executive Council Member, National Committee on Music. Dr. Edwin Antonio, representing Subcom on Cultural Communities and Traditional Arts, Head National Committee on Northern Cultural Communities. Dr. Emmanuel Calairo, representing Subcommission on Cultural Heritage and Head of the National Committee on Historical Research. The Technical Working Group for the term 2017 to 2019 and Advisory Body of the 2020 Research Colloquium. Dr. Jasmine Liana, Head, Technical Working Group for the term 2017 to 2019. Dr. Hope Yu, representing Subcommission on the Arts. Dr. Celestina Bonkan, representing Subcommission on Cultural Heritage. Dr. Vicente Handa, representing Subcommission on Cultural Dissemination. And Dr. Ajil Isduri, representing Subcommission on Cultural Communities and traditional arts. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the NCCA Research Program Colloquium for 2020. Thank you, Ms. Karina Ann Olazo. Aside from increasing awareness and celebrating research activities in the country by showcasing the works of our grantees, we will also have the great pleasure of listening to the keynote address of one of our country's distinguished scholar in the humanities. Dr. Elena Rivera Mirano is Professor Emeritus of Art Studies in the College of Arts and Letters at the University of the Philippines in Diliman, where she was dean from 2009 to 2015. She has a Bachelor of Arts in English, cum laude, a Master of Arts degree in Comparative Literature, and a doctorate in Philippine Studies from the same university. She also has a Master of Arts in Humanities from the Stanford University in America. As a researcher in the traditional culture of the Southern Tagalog region, she has authored Subli, One Dance in Four Voices, which was a National Book Awardee in the Art Book category in 1989. She also wrote Ang Mga Tradisyonal na Musikang Pantinig Sa Lumang Bawan, Batangas. It, it garnered the Gawad Chancellor, University of the Philippines, Diliman, Best Book, Humanities Category in 1998. The Life and Works of Marcelo Adonai, which he also authored, won the Alfonso Ong Pin Award and the National Book Award Art Book Category in 2009. She also authored performance notes in 2018 and served as research director for the Philippine program at the 1998 Smithsonian Folklife Festival in Washington, D.C. She also heads the Batangas, headed the Batangas City Museum in 2006. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Elena Rivera Mirano. Thank you. Good morning. I just like to correct a little correction for that last item. I was the research director uh, and consultant for the Batanga City Museum uh, many decades ago. Okay. Um, anyway, this morning, allow me to begin with a little story about an online conversation I had last Sunday with two old and dear friends that I have had the privilege of working alongside for about five decades of my life. Initiating the conversation was Marianne Pastor Roses, whose research and curation in the area of Philippine material culture is unparalleled for both its range and depth. Alone in her condo, in her condo unit, she has been posting weekly photos of rare and extremely beautiful artifacts she discovered in museums outside the Philippines while doing an exhaustive inventory of Philippine holdings in museums outside the Philippines. Uh, she did this for the Department of Foreign Affairs in 1998 in celebration of the centennial of Philippine independence. 
These postings are accompanied by short pieces where she explains the value of each object in its original society and during its historical period, and she reflects on how they can continue to speak to us today. Last Saturday, September 26, Ma Marian posted um, a powerful series of photographs of the common accoutrements or um, accessories of a Mandaya Bagani, uh, including a photo of an actual Datu in battle gear from the infamous Dean Conant Worcester collection dating from 1900. Two balarao or daggers, one made of steel, wood, rattan, textile, brass, leather, and twine, and another one made of steel, wood, tortoise shell, silver, brass wire, rattan, and leather are displayed. Both are shielded and excellently and exquisitely made. The warrior in the Worcester photo wears an extremely refined peaked helmet of painted bark and rattan strips called a sako and holds a large shield with one hand and spear with the other. I will quote from Marian's post when she explains that she is mining her material from that project. The database of the Global Inventory of Filipiniana Artifacts, Works of Art, and Selected Documents, which is housed in the Department of Foreign Affairs. While I finished this project 20 years ago, 1998 to 2000, it has not stopped haunting me as though I permanently, as though I permanent, uh, permanently carry around in my heart the pieces of dismembered bodies. The pieces that might merit a spend of some minutes of your Saturday were made by the Mandaya of Eastern Mindanao about a century ago. They are separated by continents and oceans and no longer exist among the Mandaya themselves. Soberly remembering the destruction of our National Museum collection during the Battle of Manila in 19. 45, her reflections resonate with me. And I quote her again. It is a paltry remembering. The bodies of culture will remain sundered, even with some miraculous repatriation. But there should be some value in pausing to think about our measures of quality through time, in things we make and leaders we choose. We might do well to think about things and words. Bagani. Balarao, Sako, and how they could be part of political analysis today. Close quote. Almost lost in the 128 comments that followed, this is on Facebook, don't forget, many from the highly placed and well-educated of surprise over the beauty of the artifacts and the complexity of the society that they represented, and I will quote a few of them, no? Never looked at history this way. And again, I love these forays into a culture I sadly know so little of, and these single words that contain galaxies of meaning. And the third one, it's painful to think that we have not cared enough about these treasures. Almost lost here was a reply from Felipe Mendoza de Leon Jr., our close mutual friend who is here today, June, who quietly reminded everyone that, and I quote, what history has put asunder, memory can unite again, especially through painstaking documentation. Napatigil ako eh, no? June's comment brought me back to the beginning of my career as a researcher in traditional culture when he hired me as a young instructor at the then Department of Humanities of the College of Arts and Sciences of the University of the Philippines, where he was serving as chairman in 1978. June's dream was to establish an archive and research center for the traditional visual arts. It was called TARC for short. Built on the model of his mentor, Jose Maceda Center for Ethnomusicology based in the nearby College of Music. 
recruited to teach music and assigned to teach an upper division survey of Philippine music, I reviewed my fitness for the semester ahead and realized that I could analyze a fugue, a sonata, or even a kundiman by Abelardo or Santiago, but I knew almost nothing about the entire range of Philippine music that I vaguely knew was out there. Furthermore, to my dismay, I soon discovered that there was almost nothing in the books from which I could find out what this was. The handwritten ethnographic notes about inland, upland, and coastal communities filled with ordinary people singing what seemed to us ordinary songs and playing what seemed to them even more ordinary rhythms and textures to pray to, to dance to, to live to, were still being made. And their sounds were still being recorded by my contemporaries. Maceda's assistants from anthropology who were scouring the islands collecting data. Or the recordings were being transcribed by confused music students unused to listening to and notating ritual prayers being chanted in Ibaloy or epic songs being sung in Talaandig as they sat with headphones and listened again and again in Maceda's cubby hole of an office on the second floor of the College of Music, inaccessible to the ordinary scholar. It became clear that if someone from outside the project, such as me, was to teach the subject, he or she would have to do the field work and collection himself or herself. But June was determined to build a cadre of students that would go out into the world and remember the body of the nation. And I guess he thought I would make a good soldier. I was daunted by the challenge, but I did not shy away from it because I was convinced of its value. Because of the demands of family, my family, two small daughters and a husband devoted to his hometown of San Luis Batangas, I decided to go deep instead of wide, to burrow into a single community rather than build large webs of relationships with many others. So my work in traditional music was extremely extended in time, limited in scope, but intense in method. My two major studies have focused on documenting song traditions in one Southwest Batangas cluster of towns and reconstructing the life and works of one composer born in Pakil who spent most of his life in Intramuros in Manila. I spent roughly 30 years alternating between the field and the archive to track down my data. 20 more have been spent preparing my last set of findings for dissemination. Hindi pa tapos, no? I devised my own methods for the search. I lived with people as was prescribed. I forged complex traditional relationships that last until today, which was ethically correct. While I photographed and recorded and interviewed, I studied form and technique and was accepted as a practitioner of sorts so that I could become an embodiment of my data and a bearer of that tradition. Because it's a music. The music has to be inside of you or the dance has to be inside of you before you can really understand the whole, the whole process. No? And I wrote, always from the heart. Conscious that all research is a journey involving the whole being, the physical and mental, as well as the emotional and spiritual parts of one's humanity. This last point was a gift given by another mentor, the late Ronald Walcott, ethnomusicologist, who after reading a paper I had written for him, uh, remarked to me, Elena, this is a well-written paper, but you are such a warm and open person, and I see nothing of you in it. In your writing, you must be honest with both your research informants and your readers, and show yourself in your work. Close quote. I took this advice to heart and worked on my writing style to include my voice honestly and identify myself as mediator for other voices I had listened to and learned from in the course of my research. Research is an invasive activity. 
As researchers, we intrude into the lives of others. We extract knowledge from them for one purpose or another. Thus, it has a moral and ethical, it has moral and ethical parameters. And one must never lose sight of the fact that as researchers, we are being given gifts, offered knowledge, afforded glimpse of treasures, both personal and communal, by those who give us the knowledge we seek. We must be able to receive these gifts with as much grace and humility as we can muster, respecting and honoring the informants who are the givers. The fruits of our research must therefore become a gift in exchange that will represent these people and their, their communities precisely and honestly, enhance their lives, honor their work, and give dignity to their wisdom. The information they give must not cause them harm, and we must always be careful for the safety and good standing of our informants. Our generation of researchers in Philippine, in Philippine collections was clearly aware of the results of an ethical collecting of artifacts by earlier researchers who scarred the islands for treasures to build legendary private or even government-based collections of blankets, baskets, weaponry, jewelry, and religious materials. To call, um, I remember there were stories of how agents would sweep into a town, go from house to house, sometimes with a bullhorn to call people to bring their heirlooms out into the town plaza so that the collector often connected to some powerful government official or office, um, or perhaps a wealthy trader in search of items for the international ethnic art market, could pick and choose and take away the items, leaving the impoverished community with what is referred to as lata. Another horror story still very much with us is the story, are the stories of abuse and dislocation made in the name of tourism and the touristic industry. How many practitioners of traditional arts and its material culture have been used and abused by people bringing in droves of tourists to gawk, marvel at our human finds, uh, destroy the surroundings, or perhaps line up to obtain a cheap and most often ugly souvenir, a degraded reminder of what we were once and buy it off a nearby stall set up for this purpose. Some research is always behind such endeavors. So every time I enter a community to do my own research, I'm careful to ask myself, what am I doing this for? How can I ensure the well-being of my informants and the healthy sustainability of their community life? And how similarly can I ensure that the data I collect will not be mined in support of attempts that will lead to the degradation of the environment and the dehumanization of the individuals within it. One must also be very clear that pieces of data, songs, dances, artifacts, performances, rituals, when divorced from the community that produces them, are likewise dismembered from the dynamic that produced them in the first place. In the process, their meaning shrivels up, or even worse, takes on a twisted turn. In a museum and an archive, your data is dead. It's dead knowledge, fossilized, frozen, and preserved. And even as one may marvel at the intricacy of the sound or the beauty of the object that has been documented or preserved or displayed, one cannot bring them back to the full meaning they had in the life of the community. A corollary to this sad realization is that because of history and struggle, these communities have often been yoked together to form parts of a concept called nation that creates a strain on the community as well. I remember that an early tenet drilled into me in my younger days was that we at UP were expected to put ourselves in service of the nation. And we take this very seriously. One foreign researcher once told me that he was quite envious of local researchers because unlike those of them in America who were only doing research because they needed the degrees and output that would advance their individual careers, we seemed to be filled 
with an inner vision that we were building a nation. Later on, while I was doing some field work as a, the research director for the Philippine program at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival in 1998, which brought 100 participants to the strategically located mall in Washington, DC, I had the occasion to invite Datu Miketay Victorino of Vic Saway of Atala Andig community in Lantapan Bukidnon to lead a delegation of artists from his community to join the festival saying, this can be your contribution to the nation. Datu Vic, a very reflective and charismatic advocate for indigenous people's rights, responded by asking me and himself as well, yes, but what do we have to do with nation? I ask myself now, after almost 50 years of being part of the project to create a national identity, writing major essays in university and national publications under NRCP, NCCA, CCP, what indeed has our research to do with this contentious issue of nation? I think all researchers need to seriously ponder this question. What nation is? What is it has become? What part have we had to play in its making? Where are we going? And what and whom our research will benefit? And finally, whose purposes it will serve? Karina Constantino David, who taught me how to make a research proposal back in the 70s, once to told us that we had to be careful about picking the agencies we applied to for research grants. We had to know their agendas and be wary of them because our work would be invariably aligned with their objectives. That is why I never applied for a foreign research grant, restricting myself to those given by my home university and national agencies, such as the NRCP and the NCCA. This is also why I wrote exclusively for a Philippine audience and published only in Philippine journals, sometimes writing in Filipino or in Tagalog, thus deliberately locking myself out at the time from ISI, or Web of Science, they call it now, Thomson Reuters, and other international academic publication indexes. I suspect that this personal decision must have lost me some points in the promotions framework of the un university. But I think that my career never suffered from this, strategic, from this strategic move on my part. Looking back, I realized that my primary goals in doing research were, and continue to be, what? To be a good teacher, to have a rich experience of life outside the classroom that I could share with my students. Research has allowed me to speak with authority on matters that I know about firsthand and upon which I have applied strict parameters for analysis. Good research by my fellows, my mentors, my colleagues, my students, some of whom are here today, have allowed me to expand those horizons, to include knowledge about other places and other times in the Philippines, and thus compare, contrast, and come to a more rigorous conclusion about who we are as a polity. Number two, research has allowed me to understand the sociocultural background of my husband's and now my own family, no? so that I could intelligently and sensitively participate in this life which was foreign to me. I come from UP, it's an academic community. He comes from a very traditional fishing and farming village. Doing extended research in a single place allows us to observe how things happen and the invisible social rules that cause this, occur, uh, this to occur among people living in groups. Surfacing these rules or ways of living and working in the analysis for uh, phase of research allows us to understand and smoothly navigate the social and cultural terrain one exists in. I could give you examples, but that will take us the whole day. So I guess you are researchers, you know what I'm talking about. Number three, to be able to understand my place in the larger fabric of the nation and act accordingly, I have had the privilege of working in an area where the concept of the regional self was strong and healthy. One of the things I did as a researcher was to collect bits and pieces and fragments of songs from people who remembered them, but not the whole of the historical fabric from which they had come. 
using archival references, piecing together songs, versions from different people in different villages, and comparing these melodies and extracting skeletal, in, in Tagalog they call it punto, upon which traditional improvisation was based, I was able to come up with broad theories about how these works were performed. The Batangueños of southern, southwestern Batangas were proud of their heritage and delighted by the research I had undertaken. One of them, Mr. Eduardo Borbon of Batangas City, became a lifelong friend and a central member of the Batangas City Cultural Committee. Well versed in her healthy cultural planning, he initiated, alongside my research, a program ensuring that the objects of my research, the subli, the pabasa, the awit, the pandango, were embed embedded in important institutions, school, church, and local government, handed down by village elders systematically to younger generations, and witnessed by large local crowds as part of their annual Batangas Day festivities. I also encountered a similar situation in Paki, Laguna, where the work of our UP, based, uh, UP Dileman based research group in reconstructing the music of the legendary Pakileño Marcelo Adonai uh, was, was done also from fragments and loose parts scores of works dug up from private sources in Pakil and Manila. And uh, this, this work has reached fruition in the performance of his major works, not only by local bands and choirs in community events, sponsored by the local government, attended by large audiences, drawn by the an annual Turumba religious celebrations, but has reached as far as Manila, Los Angeles, San Diego, and is being performed today. The healthy self-identity of these towns and cities with these practices and works of art because they emanate from a source that is, to cite a phrase, malalim ang hugot, can only be the basis for the construction of a true sense of nationhood. Remembering the challenge that faced us as young researchers and the journeys we took fraught with all kinds of complications, I can relate to those of you who are just beginning your work today in the light of the pandemic that renders the old me methodologies of fieldwork, the ethnographic interview, archival work, how we would do that. And my favorite method, bawal yun ngayon, the one-on-one -on -one masterclass, almost impossible. I can only imagine the challenge that the situation will impose on your research strategies. When I was beginning this paper, I kept asking myself, if this were the start of my research journey, how and where would I begin? Needless to say, I have no ready answers, except to say that if you want to do the work badly enough, you will figure out how to do it, and you will do it well. In closing, I will return to the tripartite conversation between Marian and June and myself, rephrasing what I wrote on Facebook, reminding the two of them that in many ways, this remember, remembering of a lost world was your vision, our vision, our generation, and perhaps the students that we taught devoted much of our lives towards its fruition. I'm going to... Our generation, and perhaps the students that we taught, devoted much of our lives towards its fruition. Our work in traditional art remains as an offering to the nation. We did not forget. We searched for it. We rediscovered many earlier scholars that preceded us, and we were almost forgotten. Epifanio de los Santos, Fernando Canon, Antonio Molina. We wrote about what we saw in many publications. We photographed and recorded, notated in music and dance, documented, analyzed, interpreted. Whether the nation will recognize the work or value it or not is up to our descendants. We do not know what they will deem important. But it is important that the record be there so that when future generations comb the archives and the museum collections, and they are there, 
there will be something to find, to contemplate, to mourn, to celebrate, to yearn for, to recognize, and to seek solace in. Thank you and good morning. Thank you, Dr. Elena Rivera Mirano for your edifying talk on the Philippine artifacts, the words balahao and the complete, uh, you know, the complexity that they represented, the fascination with the treasures of a lost society. I am sure that this has gotten all our audience thinking about their own researches, the need for painstaking documentation, which is the heart of cultural research, how research is also a fire. I was feeling that you were like Prometheus, giving us the gift of fire with, with this edifying talk. Uh, the NCCA wishes to express its appreciation to Dr. Elena Rivera Mirano with the certificate of our appreciation. We were supposed to post it online, the copy of the certificate of appreciation for Dr. Mirano. Ana lahat ni Jun de Leon niya. <laughs> okay. Office of the President, Republic of the Philippines, National Commission for Culture and the Arts presents the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Flora Elena Rivera Mirano for sharing her valuable inputs in the keynote as a keynote speaker of the NCCA 2020 Research Colloquium, Sali Cultura Research Methodologies. Given the second day of October 2020 via Zoom, in the celebration of the 2020 Research Grants Colloquium. Signed, Al Ryan S. Alejandre, Executive Director, National Commission for Culture and the Arts. Thank you, Dr. Mirano. I am sure that you are all excited to listen to the research work undertaken by our grantees. The first presentation is Cataloging and Baselining the Filipino-Spanish Churches of the Archdiocese of Palo on the island of Leyte by Dr. Fiorillo Demeterio III of De La Salle University, Manila and Dr. Giraldo Fernandez Jr. of the Visaya State University, Bye Bye Leyte. To present the research to us this morning is Dr. Leslie Ann Liwanag of the Department of Liberal Arts and Behavioral Sciences Visaya State University. Bye bye, Leite. Our project is entitled Cataloging and Baselining the Filipino Spanish Churches of the Diocese of Maasin on the Island of Leite. Together with me are my co authors, Dr. Feorillo Demeteri III, full professor. Filipino Department, De La Salle University, Manila, Dr. Giraldo C. Fernandez, Director for Instruction and Evaluation, former head of our department from Visayas State University, Bye Bye City Leite, and yours truly, Dr. Leslie Ann L. Liwanag, Assistant Professor, Department of Liberal Arts and Behavioral Sciences, also from the same institution, Visayas State University. Our main research problem and significance, this project cataloged and gathered as much baseline information about the seven Filipino Spanish churches of the Diocese of Maasim. And a thorough understanding of the Filipino Spanish churches of the said diocese can contribute to the existing body of knowledge on Filipino churches as well as on Filipino Spanish colonial architecture. Such knowledge could help the stakeholders in various towns of the said diocese realize the significance of their treasures and how vulnerable these are to deterioration, damage, and inappropriate maintenance and renovation. Such baseline knowledge will be important for future actions and procedures undertaken by heritage conservationists. Such knowledge about the Filipino churches of the Diocese of Maasin will help hierarchy, 
clergy, laity, and even local governments how to take advantage of the educational and touristic potentials of these treasures. Our methodology we divided into two columns. First, specific problems and goals and what specific methodology we used. First, their current locations of and their potentials and accessibility for touristic and educational visits. We used and or utilized Google Earth, site visit, and key informant interview. Their natural disaster risks, exposures, the methodology we used, use of Project NOAA, use of Fault Finder, use of Google Earth, and site visit. Their history and their old photographs, we use the methodology archival research and crowdsourcing. For numbers 4 to 10, their floor plans and dimensions, the locations and dimensions of their bell towers, their materials used for their walls, ceilings, bell towers, roofs, windows and doors, the designs of their facades and bell towers, the presence or absence of old retablos, pulpits, painted ceilings and false domes, their status of maintenance, the presence of immediately identifiable visible treasures such as paintings, sculptures, bells, and other metal works. We use the methodology site visit, use of Google Earth, and key informant interview. And lastly, the diocese, parochial, and municipal policies and practices on the maintenance and upkeep of these unique structures, the methodology that we use, archival research, and key informant interview. Early impact of our project, we were able to point out to the National Historical Commission of the Philippines that their 1983 historical marker on the Maasin Cathedral is faulty. The Augustinian friars that are mentioned there actually never worked in Maasin, Leyte, but in Maasin, Iloilo. Our interactions with the stakeholders in Maasin City had saved two heritage structures from demolition and or destruction. The more than two century old watchtower and another more than two century old section of the remaining fortification of the cathedral. This happened by making the stakeholders aware of the significance of these stone structures and what Philippine law to invoke to prevent their looming demolition or destruction. Our output number one is an article on the NHI historical marker on the Maasin Cathedral. The first output of our project is a journal article on our critic of the faulty 1983 NHI marker on the Maasin Cathedral. Dr. René Escalante of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines already assured our research team that they're going to replace the said historical marker because of the errors that we pointed out. The root of the error is the confusion of the one who crafted the text of the said historical maker about the Augustinians working in Maasin Leyte and the same Augustinians working in Maasin Uluilo. Our journal article is already in the copy editing stage with the Social Science Dileman Journal and would hopefully come out soon within this year. Our output number two is an article on the disaster risks exposures of the seven Filipino Spanish churches. The second output of our project is another journal article entitled Disaster Risks of the Seven Filipino Spanish Churches of the Diocese of Maasin, Island of Leyte, Philippines, that is based on selected hazard models and maps. Using a number of hazard models, application, and maps, we explored the vulnerabilities and resistance of the seven churches or the seven heritage structures of the diocese in as far as flooding storm surge, earthquake, volcanic, and storm hazards are concerned. The article is still under the review phase in a reputable journal. Our output number three is a monograph on the seven Filipino Spanish churches of the Diocese of Maasin. Our third output is a book that looked into the histories, 
descriptions, and status of prevention and conservation of the seven heritage churches of the Diocese of Maazim. In this book, each of the seven heritage churches has its own dedicated chapter. We have so many concluding points in our book, but we just focus on the very important one in as far as heritage preservation and conservation are concerned. This book was able to establish that the greatest threat to the seven heritage churches of the Diocese of Maasin are not the natural extreme events, nor piratical raids and wars, but the recurrent and widespread desires of the parish priests and parishioners to beautify, modify, add, and expand these seven structures coupled with the lack of interest to maintain what they see as old and uninteresting. The most dangerous period crossed by these seven heritage structures was the time from the Second Vatican Council when modernization and expansion raged until the present when more and more priests and parishioners are exposed to the deal that heritage churches should be integrally preserved and not drastically altered. There is therefore a need to draft a diocesan master plan and parochial implementing rules and guidelines for the preservation and conservation of these structures. The Diocese of Maasin and the six parishes that are responsible for the maintenance and conservation of these seven heritage structures should be more proactively collaborate with National Commission for Culture and the Arts, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, and the Escuela Taller de Filipinas Foundation. Once a clear master plan for the maintenance, restoration, and conservation of these heritage structures, even their own parishioners, including those who migrated elsewhere or are working elsewhere, would be willing to support such projects for the sake of posterity. That is all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leslie Ann Liwanag, for discussing the baseline knowledge which is important for future actions and the procedures undertaken by heritage conservationists. I am sure that with a master plan, it will be possible for other locations in the Philippines to sort of duplicate the measures that are taken to preserve and conserve our, uh, our heritage structures. So uh, our second presentation today is on low-cost documentation and conservation of cultural heritage sites by the use of 3D photogrammetry. This is going to be presented by Ms. January Febro, who is Assistant Professor of the Department of Information Technology, College of Computer Studies at the Mindanao State University, Iligan Institute of Technology. Good morning, everyone. This is January Febro from Hemisphere UIIT. I am going to discuss the output of my research, which is entitled Low Cost Digitization of Cultural Heritage Sites Using Drone and Photogrammetry. Drone photogrammetry seems to be a powerful tool for digital documentation and conservation of cultural heritage structures. The discussion of this presentation will focus on what is the research about, how it was conducted, the methodology, and lastly, the findings and conclusions. So to begin, these are some of the photos online, the Hotel de Oriente in Bonondo, the High Ally building along Taft Avenue, the historical and controversial Bahay Napula, the Loom Church in Bohol, and the mosques in Marawi City. So what do they have in common? So these are cultural heritage structures that have been damaged due to decay or time, human conflicts, and natural disasters. In the country, natural disasters are a great threat since we are located along a typhoon belt and the Pacific Ring of Fire. Cultural heritages like the Baroque churches are highly susceptible to be ruined. And just like the image 
images earlier, no one can guarantee it's continuous. So for this reason, one should ensure that they are well documented. So the question then is, how can we preserve all of these cultural heritage structures? So the answer, and it is suggested that 3D digitization, it is the most applicable method to preserve cultural heritage. So in this study, a photogrammetry technique was used to generate 3D dimensional replicas of the Philippine Baroque churches that can be viewed online to answer the call for preservation and promotion in Philippine Cultural Heritage Acts 10066. So a low-end drone was used to test its visibility as a practical and viable and expensive tool in acquiring data images. So Philippine Cultural Heritage, Heritage sites like Baruch churches is the legacy from our past civilizations which must be maintained and preserved to sustain cultural identity and continuity for future generations. Burg churches are built in 16th century, so they are declared by UNESCO as part of the world heritage because of its unique architectural design. So in this study, we enable to digitize the exterior facade of one of the most vulnerable World Heritage Sites in our country, the Mayagal Church, the San Agustin Church, the Santa Maria Church, and the Bawai Church. The photogrammetry is the art and science of determining the position and shape of objects from photographs. The main goal of photogrammetry is for mapping purposes. Consequently, the technique was linked to the achievement of the best reachable metric accuracy. So this made the use of image-based approaches for 3D models reconstruction. So there's a new innovative technology. We call this one as unmanned aerial vehicles or simply drones. They are notably being used in archaeological studies because of its low cost but effective tool that can produce a high res high resolution scaled models. Before the methods, we have three phases, the uh, data acquisition, the data processing, and dissemination. For data acquisition, we surveyed the Baruch Church site located in Ilocos Sur, Ilocos Norte, Manila, and Iloilo to capture the data images for the use of this study last year. Surveying the area and planning where the UAV took off is essential during the data collection. Flight ranges and paths are established. The UAV flight is also manually controlled due to trees or buildings around the area. The different facades and exterior walls of the church are photographed for our data collection. For data processing, we use the RC or reality capture. And for data cleaning, we use the mesh, mesh lab. So image data is integrated into a unique coordinate system by using a procedure for modeling and texture. About 500,000 to 1 million triangles are estimated for high quality simple scenes. Two different steps are followed, defining the ground plane and setting reconstruction region. Then we export the mesh to the 3D environment. So the model files are created in OBJ, JPEG, and MPL format. So for visualization, the 3D models is displayed by a web browser. So the file must be put in a web server in order for it to be accessible. So the 3D triangular mesh is computed in the desired quality. The file size is considered for models uploaded on the web by disseminating the object. So these are the output. This is the output of the study, viewable in the web browser. The workflow for photogrammetry is presented in the figure. In spite of exerting Efforts to acquire good results, we are faced with variable field conditions like time spent in the field to document each search was limited. 
rain and changing weather was our enemy aside from the environmental constraints like trees and tall buildings that surrounds the church. So thus efforts were made and work was completed under these constraints. However, so this study has achieved its goal to create 3D models of the Baruch churches that can be viewed via web browser. So using UAV photography as a low cost and accurate technique in digital documentation. So it is recommended to do our another round of survey uh, taking considerations the learning experience to, do, to produce a much better high quality output. But unlike other studies, which they combine digital technologies that are quite expensive, like the laser scanning and the beam, uh, this study only uses UAV photogrammetry. Another survey we had conducted is in the, the Kali Presologo buildings or structures found located in Vigan City. So here we only use the 12 megapixel camera to collect the 2D images. Moreover, for future research, virtual reality technology in a form of 360 degree or augmented reality can be applied to the interior of the Baruch churches and other cultural heritage structures to bring scenes to life. So the conclusion of this study greatly benefited the nation considering that uh, digital documentation of cultural heritage sites like bird churches and uh, structures found in Vigan City was possible to accomplish by simply using the low cost, non intrusive technique but with a high level of accuracy. This will be a vital piece to permanently record the form of culture, uh, important cultural heritage structures. There is a need to fully embrace and adapt cultural heritage digitization for preserving our vulnerable cultural identity for future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Miss January Febro. There is indeed a need to fully embrace and adapt cultural heritage digitization for preserving our valuable cultural identity for future generations. And this was made possible by simply using a low-cost, non-intrusive technique. Wow, the wonders of modern technology. I remember that, you know, like all these movements or all these efforts to uh, conserve and preserve our physical and, you know, cultural heritage, but you can also do your preservations with um, materials like old newspapers and um, and other, you know, like um, intangible treasures that we have. Thank you very much, presenters, for those illuminating presentations. Now the floor is open for questions. Because we are having a technical difficulty on Facebook Live, we encourage you to post your questions on the chat box. Please use the Zoom chat box that we have. And um, I have a question from Joe C. Gan. Uh, I think this is addressed to both um, presenters. Magandang umaga. Nagsimula po ba kayo sa inspirasyon at interest para gawin ito? o nakabatay ito sa teorya tulad ng lagi sinasabi sa mga researcher magsimula sa teorya kung teorya po gumamit po ba kayo na hango sa mga banyaga na lagi nating ginagamit kapag nagre-research wala po kasi akong makita na teorya na Filipino ang proponent Um, does Dr. Leslie or Dr. Uh, Ms. Febro want to address the question? Hello, good morning, Po. Hello, good morning. Yes, Miss January. Uh, uh, to answer your question, sir, uh, my uh, for in my case. I start uh, I started with an inspiration kasi nakikita ko po sa 
like sa other countries that they um, uh, this is very common to other countries but here in the Philippines kasi medyo wala pa kaya do nagsimula yung 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 project can i also answer that okay yes dr de leon oo marami na we just have to look uh, at the, uh, the books no at considering the publish if we, uh, the UP press publish a lot of books at the new uh, yung kanlungan method ah uh, ano kulandong method uh, developed by dr mina ramirez meron pang pinabi si dr rogelio pepua on research methods that are very applicable to our culture. Ganyan din si Virgil Enriquez, uh, who was the president of the Bamban San Samahan ng Sikolohyang Pilipino. There are many others. We just have to know where to look for the uh, books. Kasi mga foreign uh, methodologies hindi applicable sa kultura natin, especially mga quanti quantitative te 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 techniques. Ano yun yung positivist? This is, these are not applicable to our culture. Our culture needs more a qualitative kind of research rather than quantitative. Kasi mga Pilipino, pili nyo, mag-research kayo sa, U sa US. Pag isang tao ka, usap niyo talaga yung tao lang yun. Pero sa atin, mag-research ka, buong, bu buong kapitbahay na nakikinig sa interview. Hindi pwede yung person-to-person uh, ano, -person research sa atin. Kailangan communal. Kaya nulang ganyan sa US. Ayan, psychiatric evaluation, para yung uh, doktor, uh, yun lang pasyente. Uh, mas kaya nung research yung sila, one, one, uh, one is to one, hindi pwede sa atin yan. We have, we have been in a very communal culture. So, there have been many research methods already developed. Uh, tignan nyo yung mga publications ng Pambansang sa Mahansa Psikologi ng Pilipino. The one developed by Dr. Maceda. Eh, ano, sa Ethnomysicological Center of the Philippines sa UP. Uh, yung mga ano niya, estudyante niya, and even Dr. Mirano, kaya rin na, sinyer na yung mga research methods niya, hindi yan galing sa foreign uh, ano, books. Ang dami natin, uh, we just look at the library, and of course, publishing houses, Ateneo, uh, publishing house, UP, and La Salle, marami na rin yan. Thank you. Hello? Thank you. Uh, yes, Dr. Liwanag. Ah, okay. Um, sa tingin ko, um, kung may ibang researcher siguro na nagsasabi na parang dapat uunahin yung teorya, sa tingin ko po kasi dun sa karanasan namin ni uh, Dr. Geraldo Fernandez at ni Dr. Demeterio, sa paggawa ng pananaliksik, um, depende po, para kasi yung pagluluto eh. Minsan you start with an inspiration. Sometimes you start with what's the available ingredients. Sometimes um, you will start because out of curiosity and then dun mo na makikita yung linaw ng metodolohiya o teorya na maaari mong gamitin. So siguro sa, sa bahagi namin na nagsimula sa interest, no? nagsimula kami sa interest na uh, halugugin o siya sa atin yung mga old churches, yung, yung, yung structures nito at yung current na... na itsura nila, current na status nila, nagsimula doon, ano yung mga ilang sa mga pagkakamali o ilan sa mga dapat na hindi na isagawa para hindi maging mapanganib yung kanilang estado. So, nagsimula lang doon sa out of, out of curiosity and out of interest also na makapag-ambag. Dahil isa itong kauna-unahang um, material na ginalaw yung, yung mga estruktura or old churches dito sa dito sa late. So dito na namin nakita yung kahalagahan na ano pa kaya yung mga metodolohiya na maari nating gamitin. So for example, in, in interview katulad nung na ano kanina na mention namin kanina sa methodology. So ibig sabihin nito, um hindi estrikto yung pananaliksik is it's very fun kasi nakadepende sa iyo eh kung ano yung uunahin mo batay dun sa interest mo or sa curiosity mo. Minsan lalabas na lang na, ay, yun pala yung metodolohiya na ginagamit ko. Or minsan magsis magsisimula rin siya sa metodolohiya, tapos saka mo makikita yung context na pwede mong paggamitan ng metodolohiya. So, yun yung, ano, yun yung masaya, yun yung fun part. Dahil um, we get to be, siguro tayo yung ano, tayo nakasalalay sa atin kung ano yung uunahin natin. Depende dun sa interest na ating gustong saliksikin. So, yun lamang po. Miss Liwana, can I add to that? Apa, sige po. Magaling yan kasi hindi pwede tayo mag-umpisa sa teorya. Oh. Uh, nakakatawa if you start with theory kasi ang hahanapin lang nating data yun, nag-agree sa teorya niya. So we, okay, we, correct, we, we will be distorting the findings. 
So we started interest, interview, interview, tignan naman ang data, and then, okay, we can claim a theory based on that. Hindi pwede unahin yung theory kasi pwede distort yung outcome. Thank you. Apo, apo. I would also like to add, if I may. Dr. Fernandez, sige po. Yes, yes. We we started the actually Dr. Di Victorio and Dr. Liwana and myself started with an inspiration to catalog and do the baselining of the uh, seven, seven Spanish Filipino churches. One because we can't we want to contribute to our new diocese in Maasin who was celebrating the 50th anniversary as a diocese last year. So. We could have launched the book, but because of pandemic, uh, uh, on March uh, 31, 2019, three years before the 500th year of the first Easter Mass, which the diocese will also be celebrating, though contested it may be, but for in, in our part of the Philippines, we are this this work will be a contribution to the birth of faith in the Philippines, as as many would say. So, with regards to theory, yes. Uh, I agree with Dr. De Leon that uh, we have many Filipino methodologies. Uh, he mentions about, Dr. De Leon mentions about Enriquez, Tipua, which really we use, especially the framework of Makapilipino Pananalik Sikh. So those, uh, we, we, out of those methods, we come up with different views from our, our respondents from the ground, and which contributed very much to the to, to the writing of the book that serves an, out, an output of this research as well as the food journal articles. Diana, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yes. Aldo Fernandez and Dr. Leslie Wanag. Um, it, truly, uh, we have a lot of theories. So me, um, Josie Gan, please read some more on Philippine uh, materials that uh, Dr. Felipe De Leon had pointed out. We have yes. another question from... Uh, Mr. Jimmy Ray Gabardo, what's the difference between the research development in culture and the arts with that of social and behavioral science studies? Yeah, may, may I answer those questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. I can answer both in one sweep. You know, when you talk about uh, research, no? Uh, especially cultural research, hindi pwedeng ihiwalay, oh, hindi pwedeng gamitin ito, social science ito, ah, hindi pwedeng gamitin ito, arts ito, hindi pwede yung ganun. Kailangan holistic yung approach natin to, to the phenomenon we are studying, which is the lives of people in communities working together. So, kung sasabihin mo, hindi pwede, eh parang binakuran mo na yung sarili mo, no? That's one. Second thing is when you use terms like theory and methodology, you have to know what you're talking about. Theory is very simple. It just means you have all this data in front of you and you have to make sense of what they mean. No? So if you start from uh, some American telling you, oh, this is how you have to approach it, parang sinakop mo na yung, naging sakop ka na. Tao kaya yan, di ba? You are an individual with a mind. You are capable of putting together theory. So why don't you do it? And why don't you use your Filipino sources? I assure you there is theory there. Second, methodology. When you say methodology, you're not talking about techniques and methods. You're talking about broad approaches towards answering problems. So um, methodology is not what technology you use. It is the way you're thinking about how to get your data, how to put it together, what to use. Method is small. Methodology is much bigger. No? So, yun lang ang aking gustong sabihin. Now, when we're talking about these things, they're understandable. They're really easy to grasp. They're not these big terms that are hard to understand and you have to listen to somebody from some other country telling you what to do. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mirano. Actually, there is another question uh, addressed to you. Uh, Max Jody is saying, Magandang umaga, tanong ko lang sa keynote speaker. I'm inspired with show yourself in your research article. Mm -hmm. Ito ba'y hindi mag-contradict sa theory na we should not be biased in our study? Okay, I will ask you that question. How objective can you be? Can you not, can you be a woman? No, if you are a male, if can you be a woman? 
can you be a foreigner? Can you be, uh, can you believe in God? Can you be an atheist? Whatever your position is, kailangan malinaw yan. Because if you hide who you are and you say, no, this is objective. We are in the arts, my dear. We are in culture. This is not what they call um, quantitative research. This is qualitative. And the quality of your mind, the character of your mind will come through in your research. And if you don't reveal your bias, you're being dishonest. Dr. Mirano. Another yeah. question from Joy Rivera. Uh, sorry. Hope, can I answer that as well? Yes, D Doc Jasmine. Uh, I would just like to uh, probably add to what Dr. Mirano already said about showing yourself. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Mirano was earlier saying about research being intrusive. And uh, if you hide yourself, it's like you use a, the cloak of invisibility and you make yourself so powerful that you do not uh, entrench yourself in what you are studying. You do not, in a way, respect. No, I, I mean, at least for, for me, you do not respect uh, the, the interaction that you actually have with the informants, the sources of your data. So showing yourself is uh, actually paying respect to the subjects of your research. And then at the same time also uh, being with them, you know, being with them, which is very important because visibility actually means vulnerability. You make yourself open to uh, whatever, attack, uh, criticism, all kinds of things. And if you as the researcher hides, you know, makes yourself invisible, that is the height of the use of power you know, in research. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Jasmine Liana. Uh, we have another question from Joy Rebleza. Hello, sir and ma'am. Good morning. Would you mind sharing with me the most suitable methods that can be applied when we do interdisciplinary research combining literature and visual arts? Thank you. Who is being addressed? Who is being addressed, I wonder? I think uh, anybody can reply reply to the question on the best interdisciplinary research that uh, is applicable to literature and uh, combining literature and the visual arts. Would you mind sharing with me the most suitable methods that can be applied when we do interdisciplinary research combining literature and the visual arts? Offhand. Offhand, I would say. Uh, baka si June may gustong sabihin. June, ikaw. Hello? Ikaw Hello? na. Hello? Mm. I can, ano, I can share something about that. Wala kang sumasagot. Yeah. Has it been answered? That's it. Hindi pa po. Sige po, Dr. June. Ah, kasi kung interdisciplinary research, very powerful method yan para sa ano, arts. Because there are analogies in the arts. Analogies. Uh, I can say na pwede natin sabihin, anyway, you can, you can translate painting into music, music into literature, literature into uh, Oh no, the other arts, kasi meron silang parallelism. Uh, you can begin with concepts like space, concept of time. Kasi if you look at the concept of time in 18th century English literature, 
Uh, yun din ang concept of dance and music. There, there is also the same attitude in the visual arts. Well, uh, if, you at, if you look at the uh, Philippine visual arts, and I'll give an example visually, yung ginagawa ni Larry Al Alcala um, and Jess Abera. This, these are examples of multifocal uh, ano, renditions. Parang it, from a com communal or omniscient perspective, hindi lang isang focal center. In our, in our ano, literature, ganyan din eh, omniscient um, point of view. Saka pati sa music, pag nakinig kayo ng passion, walang isang, focal, walang isang focal center yun, walang tonal center yun. Uh, maraming centers. So there is a parallelism. I can give you, uh, kung gusto niyo Western art, para kung familiar kayo sa Western art, if you look at uh, the Renaissance, no? Ang porte ng Renaissance ay geometry. Um, yeah, hindi sila pwedeng mag-invent ng calculus at that time because they were interested in things that were balanced, structure, harmony. So if they were looking for harmony, balance, form in the visual arts, ganyan din sa mathematics, no? They would not be interested, they would have been interested in calculus kasi it's for moving objects, no? Uh, pati yung if you look at their paintings, static na static yung mga Raphael paintings, balancing balance on both sides. And then yung dalawa, Virgen Maria, St. John, and sa gitna si Cristo. Then some sense of balance, architectonic structure. Tignan nyo yung lahat ng visual arts at saka yung, maski yung, ano, maski yung subject matter ng Renaissance, mga prime of manhood or prime of womanhood, yung pinaka hindi gumagalaw, hindi madaling nagbabago ang sura. And if you look at the David of Michelangelo, uh, potential action, potential action, parang geometry, hindi gumagalaw. If you go to the Baroque, you go to the David of, uh, of Baroque, moment of action yan. Pati mga painting ni Rubens, pati yung music, nandiyan ang fugue, nandiyan na invento ang opera, which is pure movement kasi opera is drama and, uh, and music combined. You can see the parallelism in the arts, no? Uh, all over, whether in, in, Mani in the Philippines or in the, in the West. Look at analogies in the arts. At makikita nyo, they really conform to a certain uh, shared patterns, shared forms. Dahil sila ay meron silang shared worldview. Iba, isa lang ang sensibility. There is a common sensibility in a particular period which is shared by all the disciplines, including not only arts, but sciences. I can show you that science and art are both cultural products Mathematics is a very, very cultural product. Hindi exempted ang science and technology sa culture. Lahat yan ay cultural product. So that's, what, that's a method that you can use very fruitfully. Try it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. June. I also will add to that, ano, ha? Kasi yeah, so, talking about uh, literature and the visual arts. Okay, I'll give you one very specific example, which I had to deal with when I was working on the subli. Okay? Subli is a dance. And then I found out it has lyrics and it's very long. It's something like 150 stanzas of lyrics. And the lyrics are so matalinghaga, you can hardly understand what they're talking about. So there was a section noon that I was working on. Hindi ko maintindihan what they were saying. It was saying, nung una ang ganito ay naging ganun. Kaya naging ganito nasa simbahan. Parang ganun, ano ha? Ah, hirap. Ano bang ibig sabihin to? I couldn't. I didn't know what a lagudi was. I don't know what a uh, uh, what, whatever were named. Then I found out they were plants. Plants. Wala na ko. What are these plants? Wala. Hindi naman alam na mga botanist natin. Kasi noon wala pang masyadong ethnobotany. So nagtatanong ako don sa mga uh, sa kaisa isang gumawa ng ano. And then they, they directed me to some old books. So I had to go to Father Blanco. No? Father Blanco's huge book on uh, flowering plants of the Philippines, which was written in the 8th, 9th, 19th, 19th, June, ano? 19th century, La Flora de Filipinas. And then I went to Elmer Merrill's book, which is a botanical uh, book, which lists down all the species in the Philippines. Ano? This was dated American. And so, isa-isa kong hinanap yung mga plants na yan. And then I found out, these plants have medicinal qualities. 
So they're used for diuretics, they're used as ano, yung antipyretic, etc. etc. Ah, okay. And then I found out that they also have other uses. These uses were as uh, parang they, they became uh, yung mga butil-butil became ano, yung mga parts of rosaries, ganyan, ano ha. Some of them were used in the construction of kubo for, for worship in early times. So, parang Lumitaw, after studying the botanists and the people from, uh, from the sciences, na what they were referring to was that all these herbal things that the doctors had used, yung mga manggagamot had used, before the Spaniards came, suddenly were transformed into Catholic symbol, symbols. So sabi ko, importante yung image na yun, hindi ba? And that comes from literature to botany. Isn't that interesting? But you have to search. You have to dig. <laughs> <laughs> Tama. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Mirano, Dr. Uh, Professor Jun De Leon. Uh, another question from Edgardo Mar Castro. Tumatanggap po ba ng, ang grupo ni F Professor Febron na magbigay ng training sa mga interesado matutuhan ang ginawa nila? Isang paraan matulungan ang iba't ibang grupo sa bansa. Dr. Feb uh, Ms. Febro. I, I, hello po ma. I already answered Sir Engardo. Yes, yes we can para po makatulong. Okay, thank you for that. Another one from Joey Arquero. Good morning. How can we say po na low cost ang paggamit ng drone in your research? Well, in fact, napakamahal yung isang unit ng drone camera. Okay, but uh, there are high-end drones and there are low-end drones. In our case, we use the low-end drones that cost around 20K. Pero meron pang mas mababa dyan, but we, we use the DJI Spark kasi. Tapos, uh, yung megapixels niya is 12 MP lang. Tapos, we tried also using our uh, cell phone, our smartphones, which yung second... 10 megapixels lang yung resolution. Yes, it can capture the the buildings. The problem lang po is that the aerial view, yung the rooftops, that's the rooftop, that's why we use the the, the drone. Uh, uh, unlike, yung iba kasi, like the laser scanning, that, that cost millions to serve, para lang mag-survey ng area. This one, uh, using uh, UAV, so, mas lesser yung expenses. Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Febro. Uh, another from Jeric Gonzalez. Meron po bang libro na published ng NCCA na Cultural Method of Research? Sana mayroon din sa Filipino kasi magagamit ko po ito para sa pagtuturo ng... Nawala yung question. Pili Santa Maria published one. Pili Santa Maria. Okay. Thank you. Uh, by NPCA. Uh, thank you pa, uh, Dr. June De Leon. And uh, from Hope Wong, uh, good morning. What difficulties did you encounter in using those methodologies in conducting your researches as a whole? How did you manage to overcome those difficulties? Uh, I think this is addressed to any of the speakers. work at it Kasi <laughs> sana ano ko diyan kung makita mo kailangan igawin mo no maghanap ka ng somebody who will teach you sometimes it's just a person eh like for example no I needed help with kulintang I wanted to learn the principles of kulintang playing so I went to the kulintang player yung teacher sa college of music I asked her teach me naman no so, I, I, ano, I, I know the rudiments. Ganon din botanists. Pinuntahan ko sa mga kaibigan kong botanist sa academy. Tulungan mo naman ako. Okay, identify. It, okay. It's, oh, oh. Thank you, Dr. Mirano. Another one from Jerel Alpino. Good day. On the digitization of Baroque churches and an or cultural heritage sites, were there challenges encountered upon rendering the sites as 3D models? What tips do you recommend on digit 
prioritizing architectural elements without compromising their accuracy in form. Okay. Uh, I think uh, walang problema in rendering because there are many uh, softwares that we can use. The problem there is yung pag-capture. So the data acquisition, yung sa data acquisition yung problem. Because uh, there are many books or there are many ano, like videos that you can that you can watch, but really pag yung sa actual yung sa actual actual survey na yung yung na din yung parang mahirap. Because there are many, uh, yung mga obstacles kasi, iba-iba, like sa, like sa Miyagaw, iba yung problem, like yung sa uh, white church, iba din yung problem na ma-encounter mo. But for rendering, I think we can have walang problema. Ano lang po, dapat kasi yung computer mo, high-end din yung, yung processor niya. Yun lang yung problem. Kailangan high-end yung of yung computer. Thank you, Ms. Febro. Another one for from LV Lakdag. Did you encounter problems with ethical considerations in doing and publishing your researches? How did you solve these problems? Maganda itong question na to dahil ethical considerations. Uh, can any of the speakers address this? Uh, good morning. Uh, I would like to address uh, one of uh, this question. Uh, with regards to our research, uh, to talk about ethics, we, we involve respondents, parishioners, parish priests. So what we did was that we asked prior consent if they, could, they would like to, to be part of the research process. We also asked permission from the bishop of the diocese whether or not he would grant us because there might be sensible sensible information that we get from the interview process from the microscope instruction so fortunately the respondents and the bishop granted our request and of course before we before we publish the the, the book we presented the book for validation and in fact uh, we have the chancellor uh, of our diocese who made the preface of our book so with that we think that uh, we have that, uh, that that is one way of addressing ethical issues it's not so much um, difficult because we are dealing with structures not uh, not so much uh, not uh, compared to cultural other cultural researches that may transcend the bounds of ethics so i think that's uh, on our part of the study thank you very much Thank you, Dr. Fernandez. Uh, I have another question here from Edson Vicente. Sa paanong paraan maitatawid ang pananaliksik, cultural or behavioral science sa gitna ng pandemia? Ang konferensya. I think that it's, it's being explored pa lang ngayon ano pero kayo ang pinaka importanteng ano diyan eh you are the most important link yung researchers on the ground right now kasi kami ni June we already have so much data that we just sit down and write and think and then know about it no pero yung mga taong nag nangangalap pa lang ng data diyan ang malaking problema eh no um uh, how are you going to do this how are you going to do it? No? So, so you have to, I think, especially those that do yung one-on-one, -on -one, individual, personal, yung mga, uh, yung mga sa music, lalo ng mahirap. Ano? How are you going to do that kind of collecting? Hmm. Sa ngayon, hindi ko masagot. Pero yes, kapag Dr. Miron, mm -hmm. hirap nga talaga ngayon, uh, given that uh, we are limited by uh, in terms of mobility to approach people in in the advent of the pandemic. Uh, Dr. Eliseo de la Cruz has a question. Sana ay makapagbigay ng libro na publish ang NCCA para sa cultural method of research para makamit ang mga makamit ng mga LGU. Salamat po at magandang umaga. Uh, that was not a question. It's a wish. So yes, we will uh, 
look into that possibility kasi yan naman talaga ang trabaho natin sa NCCA ang mag uh, disseminate ng mga researches at mga uh, anong suporta para sa pagsasaliksik. Uh, Edlyn Almiano, as a researcher, how would you address this research development in culture and the arts to other future researchers to do more research in terms of culture here in the Philippines? Mm. Ko lang po. How would you address this research development in culture and arts to other future researchers to do more research in terms of our culture here in the Philippines? Ang dami kasi magagawa na research, di ba? Pero uh, yung unahin natin yung sariling atin dahil marami tayo. We have a gold mine in the Philippines. Ang daming questions, ang daming pwede magawa. We, we all have to do research. Kung pwede pa lang lahat ng mga mamamayan magre-research, the knowledge base will increase because it will be there. And be made available. If the issue is identified, then you can address. Pero kung talagang, what you do about research, so huge. No, it's so huge. Parang hindi lang iisa ang sagot niya. And also, you know, like if you are interested in doing research, the like National Commission for Culture and the Arts has called for researches, call for, calls for proposal, which actually ang deadline was yeah, uh, yesterday, uh, the other day, September 30. So, yung mga areas that need to be addressed are really the key areas where uh, research is going to be done or activities in culture and the arts. So, <clears throat> yung mga nasa audience, paki subaybayan so yung or paki check din yung um, website natin sa ncca.gov.ph para malaman nyo po kung ano ang mga nangyayari at an ano mga kailangan gawin natin. Dr. Mirano is flashing a... Yes. Kasi people were asking about books. This is one example of a publication. I think it was done in 1985 from La Salle. I'm looking kasi my library... Ma'am, paki ano uli? Paki... Uh, Marami yan eh. I can send you a bibliography. I can make a bibliography for you. Maraming okay. research method guides. Yun lang. They were produced by the universities at different times. Hindi naman nabuo yun, ano? Pero napakaganda. I have them all because I taught that subject for many years. Okay. There's Thank you. you very there's Ateneo. There's a national NRCP. Uh, I have a lot. And they're published, ha? Huh? They're all published. Thank you very much, Dr. Mirano. And thank you very much to our speakers and presenters. If only we had all the time in the world to talk about these exciting things, diba? We need so much time. That's why um, get-togethers like this online are very important and we can do so much more of this. And remember, we have four more are scheduled for the colloquium series. So now we will proceed to, with the awarding of the certificates of appreciation to our panel speakers. Um, <clears throat> the Office of the President, Republic of the Philippines, National Commission for Culture and the Arts presents the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Fiorillo A. Demeterio III for sharing his, inval uh, his valuable outputs as one of the panel speakers for the NCCA 2020 Research Colloquium, Salicultura Research Methodologies. Given the second day of October 2020 via Zoom in celebration of the 2020 Research Grants Colloquium, signed Al Ryan S. Alejandre, Executive Director, National Commission for Culture and the Arts. We also award the same certificate uh, citation to Dr. Geraldo C. Fernandez Jr., to Dr. Leslie Ann Liwanag, 
and to Miss January Febro. Thank you very much, speakers, for such a wonderful sharing. Uh, next week, we will have more. Now, as a child, one of my favorite parts of a program was always the intermission because this was the part where I would meet someone that I admired or I, I would be able to, you know, to attend a program um, being a great talent on stage. So have, haven't you missed seeing these performers up live? Kasi social distancing tayo. We are bringing to you live and you have front row access in the comfort of your home or office. Give, uh, help me give a, one, a round of applause for the head of the International Affairs Section of the NCCA who is going to give us um, Filipino masterpiece. Lift our spirits with, a, with this beautiful masterpiece. Uh, Miss Mary Ann Louise. Miss Mary Ann Louise for that heartwarming performance. I remember this beautiful song from way back uh, written by Constancio de Guzman. 
and sometimes performed in the baritone uh, or not not the baritone in the very low voice of Diomedes Maturan. I don't know if uh, some of you know this, especially the young ones in the audience. <clears throat> Since our theme is based on research methodologies, our guest speaker will discuss grounded theory. Dr. Brian Saludes Bantugan is currently the director of the Center for Research, Innovation, and Development, which he established at St. Paul University, Manila in 2008. He is affiliated with the Humanities Division of the National Research Council of the Philippines, the Philippine Association of Communications Educators, the Philippine Communication Society, the Research Committee of the South Manila Educational Consortium, the Man Metro Manila Health Research and Development Consortium, the Asia Network of Public Opinion Research, and the Asian Media Information and Communication Center. His research area covers media, migration, gender, culture, arts, design, and innovation. He is a writer, a visual artist, and a performer. In 2018, he completed a research project for the National Research Council of the Philippines, which looks into the use of digitized arts in the HIV AIDS related advocacies in the Philippines. Please help me welcome Dr. Brian Saludes Bantugan. Magandang tanghali po, or umaga. <laughs> um, sige po, hindi ko po makita. Yan. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Uh, Share ko lang yung aking screen bago ko magsimula. Hindi uh, po ha. We cannot see it. Apo, inayos ko po. Sandali lang po. Pakishare, paki ano, enable siguro ng multiple sharing uh, secretary. Hindi ko po makita eh. Hindi ko po makita. Okay. Wala. Sandali lang po ha. Okay, open siya siguro muna, sir, ang, ang file and then screen share. Naka-open na po. Wala po siya sa option sa share screen. Sa ano? Sa show windows? Parang ganun. Nang options ito. Hmm. Ayan. Ayan, sir. Apo. Okay, okay. We can see it na Dr. Bantugan. Thank you. Slides. Okay, magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. So kanina narinig ko po yung mga tanong tungkol sa paggawa ng teorya no? uh, sa Pilipinas. At sa palagay ko yung ibang mga tanong kanina ay masasagot. Sana po ay masagot. Um, una po sa lahat, uh, gusto ko ipakita yung aking pinanggalingan no? na mga disiplina. So iba-iba po yung aking hugot. So mula sa sining, sa visual arts sa komunikasyon na isang uh, social science at meron pong mga hard sciences din ako na background. So bakit ko po gustong sabihin ito? Kasi uh, kanina po lumabas yung uh, tanong about uh, pagiging bukas or transparent. No? So maganda pong makita ninyo kung kanina nyo natutunan yung grounded theory. Kasi kung pupunta po kayo sa internet, marami pong mga issue ang lalabas tungkol sa grounded theory. At yung ipapakita ko po sa inyo o ibabahagi ay uh, na, nasala mula sa aking hugot, no? pinanggalingan. Okay, so ang aking pong assumption ay research is inherently creative. So uh, gusto ko lang kung tugunan yung tanong na 
paano tayo magiging malikhain sa research kung ang research ay merong mga merong mga ano uh, standards, merong mga format ganyan. Sa sa limitasyon po na binibigay ng research, marami pong oportunidad para maging malikhain. No? Ang kailangan lang po sa research ay maging aligned tayo sa ating paggawa ng research. Ibig sabihin na hindi po sabog ang, ang mga elemento sa ating paggawa ng research. Uh, at Brian, yung screen niyo po ay nag-lock ano, so, nag screen. Uh, uh, Paki-enter siguro or back, ano, baka, baka uh, uh, I don't know, parang nag-hang or yeah. Naka-share pa naman po at mayroong screen sa akin. Sa iyo. Okay. okay. Uh, okay. Isang line lang po ang screen. Wait lang po ha. Oh, sige. We can okay see. Na okay, okay, na okay. Sige po. So, uh, inadvocate po po yung indigenous mindset sa research. Ma malamang hindi po siya ganun ka-popular ngayon. Pero ang indigenous mindset po ay yung pagtingin sa lahat ng phenomenon or phenomena sa pananaw ng isang uh, tao na ang tingin sa mga bagay ay lahat ay magka magkakaugnay. No? Yung interconnectedness. At ang research ay isang paraan upang ibalik ang pagkakaugnay-ugnay ng lahat. So it is a, a, a means to heal relationships between people, cultures, institutions, and systems. So iba po yung paggawa ng research na ang tinitignan ay indigenous communities o pamamaraan ng pamuhay ng mga indigenous communities. Pero ang pinanggagalingan na pananaw ay hindi naman indigenous. So ang aking inadvocate po ay pagtingin sa mga bagay-bagay na ang pananaw ay gamit ang indigenous mindset. Ngayon, uh, gusto ko lang linawin, ano po ba itong aking talk? No, Unang-una, hindi po ito how-to. Kung gusto nyo pong mag-how-to, marami po sa internet, mag-YouTube po kayo, ang dami nyo makita. Kaya lang, ang, siguro ang kailangan kong i-address ay paano kayo uh, makakapili no? kung ano doon ang inyong susundan or susundin. Kasi, Uh, marami rin naman mga conflicting na mga ideas online. So dapat ma magkaroon kayo ng pangamaraan para ma matimbang kung ano nga ang tamang gawin no, sa, sa grounded theory. Hindi rin ito pag-deepening pag of understanding or yung mga micro details ng GT or grounded theory. Kasi limitado po ang oras natin. So inisip ko na ang pinakamahalagang bagay na matutunan nyo ngayong araw ay yung Paano nyo ba titimbangin yung paggamit nito or hindi paggamit ng grounded theory? Uh, hindi rin ito magre-resolve ng mga issue kasi tulad ng binanggit ko kanina, marami pong issue nakapaligid sa grounded theory. 1967 po nung una itong inilabas at alam natin na medyo matagal bago maayos o ma masystematize ang grounded theory. At bilang isang hindi positive, positivist na pamamaraan, hindi po siya pwedeng ikulong kaya medyo mahirap pong ma-resolve ang mga issues sa paligid ng grounded theory. At hindi rin po ito isang critical analysis sa pagtingin kung ano ang relasyon ng grounded theory sa iba pang mga pamamaraan ng pananalitsi. So ito ay why to, bakit natin pwedeng gamitin or bakit natin dapat gamitin ang grounded theory pagtingin sa mas malakihang pananaw kasi marami pong iba't ibang klase uh, ng grounded theory. Uh, ipipresent lang po yung mga issue para makita nyo kung gaano ka-applicable ang grounded theory kung meron kayong gustong pag-aralan. At maganda rin tignan na ang grounded theory kasi ay hindi siya elementary research uh, process. No? Isa, isa siyang mataas na antas na uh, paggawa ng pananaliksik. So mahalaga ang nuancing sa grounded theory. Uh, ano po yung ugat ng uh, grounded theory? Ang grounded theory ay nagmula kay Glasser at uh, Strauss at tinignan nila yung pamamaraan ng paggawa ng teorya o paggawa ng research sa kanilang disiplina uh, mula sa undertaking the awareness of dying. So ang pinagugatan pinagugat nito ay health. No? Uh, in fact, ma malakas ang grounded theory sa nursing. So hindi siya nagsimula bilang isang social science nag umusbong ang social science ang grounded theory sa social science kasi nga ang orientasyon ng grounded theory ay social science so magandang simulan natin Excuse ano ba me, yung... Dr. Bantugan oh. yung ano yung slide kasi parang crap siya 
yung pinakagitna lang ang nakikita. Parang naka-zoom ah. siya. So, pwede i-unzoom para yung buong screen ang makita po. Ngayon ko lang po kasi nakita itong... Teka lang po ha. Okay. Salamat po. Uh, meron green. Ngayon ko lang nakita itong green na to. Wait lang po. Uh, pasensya na po. Yan. Okay na po ba? Okay. Pwede na siya. Okay. Yan po. Thank you. Yes. Po. Thank you very much. Okay. So, maging sanan we're on the same page, no? Kailangan natin tingnan yung core concept sa research. Kasi minsan napaghahalo-halo ang mga konsepto, no? Tulad ng sinabi kanina uh, ni Dr. Mirano, ibang methodology, ibang method, ibang approach, iba ang paradigm. So, unang-una, um, bago tayo gumawa ng research, may pinagmumulan tayong paradigm. At kadalasan, nakita natin ang conflict or paghihirap sa paggawa ng research kasi hindi tugma ang paradigm doon sa mga pamamaraan o metodolohiya. Kaya doon sa isyu kanina na ano po ba ang dapat na metodolohiya para sa isang interdisciplinary research, ang una kong tanong para sa inyo is saan ba kayo nakatungtong? Ano po ba ang inyong paradigm? Kasi kailangan nyo ilinya ang lahat sa inyong research buhat sa inyong paradigm. No? So yung worldview or paradigm or perspective. No, so, uh, ang paradigm ay isang konsepto mula sa social science kasi nakita nila na hindi lang isang pananaw ang pwede natin gamitin sa paggawa ng research. So, umusbong yung realidad na meron tayong pagtingin sa bawat research na ginagawa natin, daladala natin yon at siya yung nag influence sa paggawa natin ng research. Pangalawa, uh, tingnan natin, uh, meron mga sinonym yan, eh. may worldview, ganyan. Ang worldview naman ay medyo layman, no? hindi siya very scholarly na, na uh, terminology compared sa paradigm. So nilabas ko lang siya para makita natin na pareho yung paggamit niya at para mas madaling maunawaan ng iba. Ganon din ang perspective. Ang perspective kasi is medyo visual ang kanyang uh, orientasyon. Pero maganda rin natin gamitin ang perspective kasi uh, very... Ano, very good metaphor siya for the way we conduct our research. So ibabalik ko kayo sa perspective kasi yan po ang aking uh, pinanggalingan na disiplina sa, sa, sa arts. No? So meron tayong one-point perspective, may two-point perspective, may three-point perspective. At depende sa perspective ninyo, whether isa o dalawa or tatlo, mag-iibang tingin ninyo sa isang bagay. No? Iyahalin tulad ko siya sa iba't ibang paraan ng research. So, ang one-point perspective is isa lang ang pangamaraan na paggawa ng research na very prominent noon, no? nung very positivist ang orientasyon natin sa, sa research. Kaya kung magre-research ka, kailangan positivist ka. Pero merong mga reaction dyan kasi nakita nila na ang paggawa ng research ay limited sa ganoong pamamaraan. So, nakita nila na merong mga realidad o katotohanan na hindi, hindi natural science lang ang scope. No? Merong social science na kapag ang domain ninyo ay kasama na ang tao, medyo nag-iiba ang realidad. At meron din namang uh, pananaw na three-point perspective, ibig sabihin mas marami pa dito sa dalawang ito na binibigyan ng pagkakataon ang mga tao na gumawa ng research batay sa kanilang uh, interpretasyon o pa paraan ng pagtingin doon sa isang bagay na kanilang sinasalisi. So dito, kailangan nating i-stretch no? uh, na i-stretch ang ating pag-unawa na ang research ay isang pamamaraan lang o isang pananaw lang pinaghuhugutan. Maraming ways no para gumawa ng research. At nakita ko na malaki pa rin ang confusion no. Madalas na yung post pa rin yung one point perspective na ito lang ang pamamaraan kaya ang mga tanong ay ano po ba ang dapat na ginagawa? Hindi po ganun kadali kasi kung titingnan ninyo kung saan ang hugot ng isang research, maraming dapat pagdesisyunan, no? At lalo na sa grounded theory, makita niyo sa bandang dulo na marami kayong dapat pag-isipan bago niyo siya gawin. Okay? So, ang positivist perspective, inihihalin tulad ko sa isang one-way, one-way perspective or one-point perspective. Ang post-positivist na kadalasan ay social science ang ang affiliation niya ay uh, Itinitignan niya na pwede niyang pagsamahin yung dalawa depende kung ano yung pangangailangan no? ng kanyang pananaliksik. Ang interpretivist naman, ang, ang hugot niya ay uh, depende sa pa paraan ng pagtingin mo yung lumalabas na katotohanan tungkol sa isang bagay. So, interpretasyon yung pinakamahalaga, hindi yung objective reality ng 
isang bagay. So, siguro dapat tapusin na rin natin yung tanong na dapat ang research objective lang. Hindi kailangan lahat ng research ay objective. Kung subjective ka, kailangan maging lantad ka sa iyong pinanggagalingan na perspective. So, in that sense, alam ng mga tao kung saan ka nang gagaling na ngayon pinapakita mo ang isang paraan ng pag-unawa sa isang bagay. So, hindi po siguro dapat nating tingnan na objective lang na parang a natural science ang pamamaraan para gumawa ng isang pananaliksi. So, gusto ko lang ilinawin din yung um, pagkaka, ano, pagkaka, pagkalito sa paradigm at sa approach. No? Ang paradigm ay pananaw. Ang grounded theory ay hindi isang pananaw. Ito ay isang approach o paglapit sa iyong gustong pag-aralan. So, um, dito sa uh, larawan na ito, makita nyo lang na sinasabi ng grounded theory, uh, sinasabi na ang grounded theory ay isang isang palapit na hindi hindi pareho ng positivism. Kasi ang positivism is scientific truth refer, uh, reflects an independent external reality. Samantalang sa grounded theory na may iba't ibang klase ng, ng paradigm. Pwede siyang post-positivist, pwede siyang interpretivist, pwede siyang constructivist, uh, na pwede niyong tignan ang isang bagay mula sa observation na inilalabas niya yung independent na external reality ng isang bagay, o pwede niyo rin tanungin ang mga tao, ano ba yun para sa kanila o para sa kanilang buhay, gaano ba siya kahulugan? Ano yung kahulugan ng isang bagay na yun sa pamumuhay ng mga tao? So, pwede ninyo siyang pagsamahin sa grounded theory. Ang pagkakaiba lang sa grounded theory ay kung gaano ka, ano yung extent ng pagsasama ng isang positivist at uh, interpretivist or constructivist na paradigm sa isang grounded theory na pag-aaral. So, ang grounded theory ay isang research approach. Pero hindi lang, lang siya research approach, siya rin ay isang methodology at method din siya. Kaya kapag pinag-usapan natin ang grounded theory, dapat malinaw sa atin, ano ba ang tinutukoy natin pag grounded theory yung pinag-uusapan? Tinitingnan ba natin siya bilang approach? Tinitingnan ba natin siya bilang isang metodolohiya o strategiya sa paghanap ng sagot? O tinitingnan natin siya bilang teknik o step by step paano siya gawin? No? So ang gusto ko lang linawin ay hindi siya paradigm, isa siyang research approach na ang pinagmulan ay isang post-positivist perspective na reaction sa positivism sa pananaliksi. So, hindi ito synonymous sa research paradigm. It is a manner of getting close to the phenomenon, isang lapit. May, may involve more than one research method. So, ibig sabihin, ang, ang grounded theory ay pwedeng maghalo-halo ng mga method na pertinent or kailangan gawin para pag-aralan ng isang bagay. No? So, ang method ay mas maliit na konsepto kumpara sa approach. At it is not a research method. When I say method, uh, pamamaraan ng pagkuha ng impormasyon. Kasi meron din namang method na pag, uh, pag-process ng impormasyon para maging datos siya. No? So, uh, ang, ang, pagsabit, ang paggamit ko ng uh, salitang method dito ay yung data, data construction, data, uh, data gathering na sinasabi na method. Analytical method siya. No? So ulitin ko, isa ay approach, hindi siya paradigm, hindi siya method. Bilang um, uh, metaphor, kung ang teleskopyo po ang ating paradigm, paraan ng pagtingin, ang approach ay kung paano natin lalapitan yon ano po yung ating pangamaraan, at ang yung method ay paano, ano yung gagamitin natin para makarating tayo sa ating patutunguhan. Um, gusto ko rin mag-expand doon sa approaches. No? Kung, kung approach yung pag-uusapan, meron tayong general at merong specific. Uh, gusto ko tong linawin kasi pag pumunta kayo online, ginagahalo nila ang mga approach at design. No? Uh, para lang sa consistency at malamang hindi nyo makita ito online sa pamamaraan na binigay ko sa inyo, uh, gusto ko lang na i-discuss ito para yung idea natin ng grounded theory ay align, hindi nagkakahalo-halo yung mga terminolohiya natin. So, pag dating sa general research approach, meron tayong quantitative, meron tayong qualitative, may pragmatic, no, yung paghahalo, depende su- sa kung ano yung maaring gawin sa panahon na ginagawa nyo yung pananaliksik, o emancipatory, o yung 
uh, isang klase ng pananaliksik na gustong baguhin yung nakikita nilang realidad. No? So, yan. So, magkaiba ang research approach ang method. Uh, iba rin yung general sa specific. Kasi ang specific research approaches natin, depende kung quantity or qualitative ka, merong iba't ibang klase din. For example, ang quantitative, may polling, may testing, may quasi-experiment, may data mining, may meta-analysis. Hindi ko po nilagay ang experiment kasi hindi maaaring gumawa ng experiment sa isang social science. Hindi rin po siya ethical, kaya quasi lang yung nilagay ko. Ang experiment po ay very positivist. No? Uh, reaction po ang GT sa positivism, so hindi ko po siya inilagay dito. Uh, pagtitignan natin ang qualitative, may narrative inquiry, may multiple or case study, may phenomenology, ethnography, at dito po nakapasok ang grounded theory. So pag-iba-ibahin pag natin, no? tingnan natin yung pagkakaiba-iba. Mula sa research paradigm, kailangan natin bumaba sa mas specific na konsepto na research approach. Kailangan pa natin bumaba ulit no, from general to specific research approach. At mula sa approach na specific, meron yung dinidikta na research design. So mula sa post-positivist, nag nagkaroon ng emphasis sa qualitative at nagkaroon ng pinto para mag uh, magawa natin ng grounded theory. So ano yung mga research design na pwede natin gamitin? Na, nandito po yung iba't ibang klase. Uh, paumanhin po kasi I don't think this is the, the opportunity to uh, delineate or distinguish between the different kinds of research designs. Ang gusto ko lang sabihin dito ay hindi po research design ang grounded theory. Ito po ay mas malaki. No? Ang research design ay kung paano mo pagsasamasamahin ng iba't ibang metodolohiya. So para ang research design ay methodology, kaya lang ang research design ay mas na align sa sa mas creative or mas social science ng mga pananaliksik. Ang methodology ay mas madalas gamitin sa positivistic na research. So ano yung mga core concepts na dapat nating uh, maunawaan sa grounded theory? Ito ay aking kinuha mula sa sa article na ito sa uh, mula kay Linden. Uh, ang grounded theory ay mas bagay para sa mga complex systems. Pag sinabi natin complex system, masalimuot po ang realidad na gusto niyong pag-aralan. No? Ang complicated system kasi ay medyo mas simple. Although system din siya, at kung system yung pag-uusapan, ano po, um, merong kinalaman ng bawat elemento ng sistema sa isa't isa. Kaya kapag binago mo yung isa, maapektuhan lahat. Pero kung ikukumpara ninyo itong mga complex na ito, system, at ito pa, mga examples lang po ito, at ikumpara nyo ito sa ganitong klase ng system na interconnected din naman siya, medyo mas linear itong isa, although umiikot siya para magkaroon ng interconnections. No? Ang gusto ko lang pong sabihin, ang grounded theory ay ginagamit para sa mas mga mas masalimuot na phenomenon. Kung laboratorio po, kung very simple ang inyong gustong tingnan at very positivist kayo, huwag ninyong kunin ang grounded theory. Hindi po siya bagay. No? Mas maganda siyang tingnan sa, sa isang uh, phenomenon na mas complex. Okay? So ito rin po ay gusto kong ipaunawa uh, sa inyo. It is inductive no? as, uh, as an end. Pag sinabi kong inductive, um, ang ang dulo nito ay isang teorya. Mula sa mas spesifiko, lumalaki siya sa mas general. Kaya siya inductive. Although gusto ko siyang i-clarify na sa pagpunta ninyo sa, sa end, no, sa isang teorya sa dulo, meron kayong mga dinadaan ng pam pamamaraan ng pagsusuri na inductive, deductive, at abductive. So ang tinuturing ko po dito na inductive ay yung kaduluduluhan. Lumilikha tayo ng isang teorya. At ang, ang mas matimbang sa kanya ay qualitative. At kung titignan ninyo ang iba't ibang sources sa internet, makita ninyo na ang pamamaraan ay naka-anchor sa coding. So ito ay uh, pag, pagbasa ng mga narratives at paggawa ng mga konsepto at mga categories at mga codes para marating natin ang isang teorya. So mas matimbang sa kanya ang qualitative. Uh, na naka-connect din to sa ano sa symbolic interactionism na pinoforward ang idea ng constructivism na ang lahat ng bagay nililikha natin. Na ang scientific knowledge ay hindi independent sa isang researcher 
ang scientific knowledge ay nililikha ng isang komunidad ng mga scientists. So walang objective reality ang ang scientific knowledge kasi naka-ancla yan sa paggawa ng mga tao sa isang komunidad na scientist or scientific. No? So, uh, symbolic interactionism, malaki yung influensya niya sa grounded theory. No? Lalo na sa interpretivist paradigm. Uh, para sa philosophical relationships, no? uh, I think magandang tignan natin to kasi hindi, I, I don't think bagay ang grounded theory sa sa mga tao na hindi nakakaunawa doon sa level ng philosoph philosophical influences ng grounded theory. Kasi maraming mga desisyon kayong dapat gawin na nakabatay sa pag-unawa ninyo sa extent ng influence ng isang particular na philosophy sa approach na gusto nyong gawin sa grounded theory. Uh, for example, ang grounded theory influenced by symbolic interactionism produces a lot of different kinds of uh, um, uh, what do you call this? Uh, interpretivist, no? Uh, gra uh, grounded theory, no? So, merong epistemological, may social, social, psychological, at mathematical. At dahil dito, sa pagkakaiba-iba, meron din tayong iba-ibang mga grounded theory. So, meron tayong classical o yung tinatawag na CGT. Meron tayo yung mas Straussian or yung uh, SGT, kasama si Corbin dyan. At meron din tayong constructivist at ngayon lumulutang ang feminist grounded theory. Uh, gusto ko pong i-distinguish uh, uh, yung bawat isa. So una, punta natin ang classical grounded theory ni Glaser. Si Glaser ay nakipag-trabaho uh, dati with Strauss. No? Si Strauss ay humiwalay sa kanya later on. Pero noong 1967, pareho silang nag-isip na maring may ibang pangamaraan para lumikha ng teorya at hindi lang tayo yung laging tumitingin sa teorya at bineverify natin kung, kung align ba sa teorya yung ating nakikita. So, reaction nila yun. No? Pero noong 1978, hiwalay na si Glaser at si uh, Strauss, kaya ang classical grounded theory ay associated lang kay Glaser. So, si Glaser points out that CGT allows the data to be developed without preconceived ideas. So, ang pinagmula niya ay tabula rasa. I think lumabas kanino yung tanong na, Pwede ba ang tabula rasa? Meron bang tabula rasa? Uh, at yun later on yung uh, reaksyon nila Strauss at nila Shamas doon sa uh, grounded theory ni Glaser. So ang, ang para kay Glaser, hindi naman pwede ang pure objectivity. Pwede naman natin siyang ma-maximize, ma-optimize until what extent can we be objective. And if we, we reach that point, then pwede yun. No? Yun yung gusto nating puntahan sa classical grounded theory. Open siya na meron merong realidad na hindi completely objective, no? Pero ang kanyang tuon ay doon sa to what extent can we be objective without being tied to the parameters of the positivist research, no? So CGT does not test hypothesis but can propose an hypothesis at the end. Kasi nga nagpropropose tayo ng theory sa dulo, so maraming mga kabit ng mga hypothesis yan, tinetest natin yan all the time, so sa dulo mayroong hypothesis. Wala sa simula. Tapos ang CGT operates with an inductive-deductive mix. So uh, kapag tinitignan natin ang ating mga code o yung mga tema natin or themes, tapos tinitignan natin ang concept, kung align ba sila, gumagawa tayo ng inductive-deductive process ng pagsusuri. So nakapaloob siya sa classical grounded theory. At para kay Glaser, ang review of literature ay hindi dapat ginagawa sa simula. Dapat nasa dulo siya kapag nalikha mo na ang iyong teorya. Nagda-dialogue ka doon sa mga existing na literature. So iba ang kanyang format. So uh, hindi natin, natin dapat i-impose ang positivist format doon sa grounded theory. So it is open to substantive or yung mga mas lokal na teorya kaysa sa... Uh, ah, Open siya sa lokal na teorya at open din siya sa formal o yung mas malawak na teorya. Pero ang sabi niya, kung gagawa kayo ng CGT, kailangan pumili lang kayo ng isa. Hindi niyo sila pwedeng pagsamahin. So GT can use any kind of data. So pwede siyang quantitative, pwede siyang qualitative. Ang kagandahan ng CGT, kumpara ninyo sa positivist, ay bukas siya sa qualitative na hindi dati ginagawa noong 1967. No? Hindi siya legitimate na data. No? Ang ngayon ay binuksan ng GT para 
maunawaan natin ang konteksto ng, ng datos na nakukuha natin. Pero ang gustong ipaalam ni Glaser ay baka kailangan nating maging conscientious, no? hindi tayo masyadong reflexive kasi baka ma-overpower niya yung ating gustong puntahan. So ang Strauss siya naman ay uh, gusto niya na um, gusto niyang tingnan yung isang bagay na beyond doon sa tabula rasa. Ibig sabihin, imposible ang tabula rasa. So bakit natin pupuntahan yun? No? So ang sabi ng Straussian GT, it, uh, all kinds of social phenomenon have both objective and interpretive facets. Kaya yeah, bagay na bagay ito sa, ano, sa social science kasi nagmi-mix tayo ng, ng uh, approaches. No? So Hypotheses about relationships among categories are developed and very verified as much as possible during the research process. So kung ang CGT, ang hypothesis mo ay nasa bandang dulo, ang hypothesis ay pinoproseso ninyo sa Straussian grounded theory doon sa analytical na phase ng theory. So magkaiba. No, ang Straussian GT emphasizes deduction, verification, and validation. So merong mga nagaganap na gantong proseso habang ginililikha natin ang teorya na hindi ninyo makikita sa classical. Ang Straussian GT uses um, uh, the literature in the early stage, stages of the research. So pwede kayong mag-literature review, no? hindi katulad ng classical. No? So at tapos, uh, organized according to the elements of paradigmatic uh, or uh, formal model. So medyo mas mataas ang gusto niyang tahakin na, na teorya or modelo. Hindi siya nagbibigay ng option. Ang gusto niya, kung kaya mong iakyat, mas abstract, mas maganda. So, Straussian GT is known for its use of reflexivity and relativism, no? uh, relationality. So, kung titignan ninyo, ibang-iba yung orientasyon. Si Strauss ay dating kasama ni, ni uh, Glaser, pero si Strauss po medyo OOC, medyo obsessive compulsive siya sa, sa pagproseso ng datos. No? Kaya, makita ninyo sa pagko-coding o pag paggawa uh, ng mga tema mula sa mga naratibo, makita nyo na mas masalimuot ang proseso ni, ni Strauss kaysa kay, kay Glaser. Tapos, uh, medyo later na po ang constructivist, pero ito yung mas extreme na interpretivist. No? Um, observations form an accurate reflection of the world. So walang problema sa interpretasyon. Reflection siya ng katotohanan ng mga bagay-bagay sa paligid. Although ang problema niya ay hindi niya dinidistinguish ang constructionism na mas general at yung social constructionism na associated sa individual focus at social focus no? respectively. Uh, basta ang sa kanya, constructionism ang core na prinsipyo. No? Hypothesis testing has no place kasi nga completely and extremely qualitative na ang kanyang orientasyon. Tapos, makikita ninyo merong abduct, abductive data processing. Ano yung abductive? Hindi masyado tayong familiar sa abductive. Ito po ay proseso ng paggawa ng konklusyon kahit na merong puwang sa ating impormasyon. So, hindi natin alam kung, kung kumpleto yung datos para gumawa tayo ng, ng teorya. Pero, tatak parang tatalon tayo para gumawa ng teorya given the information that we have. So a well-rounded literature review is uh, respected to other, um, sorry, um, ang kailangan natin ay isang literature review para makita yung contextual understanding. So mas mahalaga yung konteksto, no? mas specific. It is oriented towards substantive or local than, than the formal, no? mas mas doon tayo sa, sa mas lokal. No? Uh, kumpara mo sa Strauss siya na medyo doon siya sa mas formal, mas mataas. And demands theoretical sensitivity, uh, sensitivity and reflection. Dahil nga interpretivism ang kanyang anchor, so dapat meron kang sensitivity at reflection, na uh, reflective process. Okay, so ang feminist naman po ay pwedeng Classical, pwede siyang Straussian, pwede siyang constructivist, pero nilalapatan nyo lang ng isang feminist or critical na pananaw. So, uh, isang, isang high, uh, next level or second layer siya ng pagproseso sa grounded theory. 
So, uh, mula dito, makikita ninyo na very stringent ang, ang grounded theory. Kailangan na ang gagawa nito ay marunong sa nuancing. Very, very uh, fine ang kanyang pag-distinguish ng mga konsepto. Lalo na sa proseso ng pag-proseso ng Ah, sa proseso ng paggawa ng datos sa mga naratibo, kailangan talaga makita mo yung very, very detailed distinction between the, the concepts. Tapos, maganda rin na tingnan na uh, self-reflexivity is also important because the way you, you will use literature will depend on what kind of grounded theory you will use. So, yung paggamit mo ng literatura ay nakabatay sa pananaw mo kung paano mo gagawin ang grounded theory. Ayan, ito po yung pinanggalingan ng, ng mga pananaw na yan. At gusto ko lang pong uh, ipaalam sa inyong lahat na merong tatlong basic na pagkakaiba-iba yung tatlo. No? Yung pinaka-core uh, na variations ng grounded theory. Una, sa kanilang opposing philosophical positions, di ba? philosophical basis niya. Secondly, yung paggamit ng literatura. Pangatlo, yung paraan ng pag-code o pag, pag uh, paglalabas ng mga themes or mga categories or concepts mula sa narratives na makuha ninyo. Okay? At gusto ko rin sabihin na depende kung sinong kausap ninyo, ang philosophical basis niya ay mag-iiba-iba rin. No? So kailangan nyo talagang magbasa. Kasi kung ang Glasserian at Straussian ay post-positivist, makita nyo iba yung ginamit na term, moderate positivism siya. No? For Corbin and Strauss, interpretivist siya. Pero pagdating nyo dito sa isang source, post-positivism and symbolic interactionism siya. Pagdating natin kay Charmas na constructivist, constructivism at symbolic interactionism. So, ang isang basic researcher, yung nagsisimula pa lang, mahirapan siyang gawin to kung hindi siya mahilig magbasa at hindi siya mahilig magresolba ng mga philosophical issues. Kasi mamimix niya yung iba't ibang pamamaraan ng paggawa ng grounded theory. So, mapili ko ang grounded theory para sa mga gumagawa ng pananaliksik. So, klaro naman na sa atin ang use ng literature at yung coding, mamaya ipapakita ko yung pagkakaiba-iba nila sa mas broad strokes na pamamaraan. Okay, ito po yung pinanggalang, pinanggalingan ng uh, mga ideas na yan, yung matrix. So, um, para sa akin po, it, ang, ang grounded theory ay hindi isang information acquisition process na parang interview. Ang interview ang method. Ang method... Ang, ang grounded theory ay isang methodology, paraan ng paggamit ng iba't ibang method para na magkaroon ng, ng information. But an information processing procedure, it is an analytical method. Pag meron ka ng mga information, dyan na papasok ang grounded theory sa step-by-step -step na technique. At pag pinag-usapan natin ng method, pwede natin papuntahan ang method with a small m, yung technique. Step 1, step 2, step 3. Kung method as strategy or methodology, methodology, ito yung big M. Ito yung paano mo paghahalu-haluin ang iba't ibang pamamaraan para makuha mo yung sagot sa malaki mong tanong. At methodo methodology in general, ito yung aabot ka doon sa level ng philosophy. So ito yung MG. So may encounter nyo tong iba't ibang klase ng pakahulugan sa methodology kung susuriin ninyo yung iba't ibang klaseng sources online. No? Ang kagandahan, ang dami nyo nang makikita. Whereas before, before the internet, ang hirap i-resolve ang mga issue lalo na limited ang ating pag-unawa sa method. No? Ngayon, marami na. So, ang, ang um, grounded theory po ay isang journey towards abstraction. Mula sa narrative, mag-derive mag kayo ng code Ito yung code, pag pinagsama-sama nyo nyo, magiging konsepto. Pas, pag mas naging general na sila ng konti, magiging categories na sila. At pag pinagsama-sama nyo na ang mga categories at lumikha na kayo ng iba't ibang klase ng ugnayan sa mga categories, nagiging teorya na siya. So, minention ko po ang iba't ibang terminologies na to kasi kadalasan sa isang nagsisimula pa lamang na researcher, ang hirap pong unawain. No? Pero yung paggamit ng mga concept na to May layers, may levels siya ng complexity. So, puntahan natin ang classical na GT or grounded theory. Ganito yung proseso niya. Meron siyang substantive coding, pagkatapos niyan, may theoretical coding, pagkatapos niyan, gagawa ka ng grounded theory. So, ang substantive coding ay kung meron kayong narrative, pipili kayo ng mga keyword, 
bawat line per line, no? Kung kukuha kayo ng keyword at pagdating ng selective coding, makita nyo merong mga words na nag-gravitate sa mas malaking konsepto. At doon sa malaking mga konsepto nito, kapag nakita nyo na, iuugnay nyo na yan sa isa't isa, magkakaroon na kayo ng theoretical coding, ano na yung relasyon nila sa bawat isa para makakuha kayo ng isang grounded theory. So medyo mas simple ito kumpara ninyo sa Straussian, no? Strauss and Corbin. Ito po ay mga paliwanag na makikita ninyo later on sa source na i-mention ko mamaya. Para mas uh, mabilis lang po tayo, isi-skip ko na lamang siya. So, ang susunod ay yung grounded theory na nilika ni Strauss at Corbin. At mapapansin ninyo na ang kanilang procedure ay medyo mas mahaba. Meron kayong open coding na katulad nung sa classical. Ang actual coding ay pinagbabangga ninyo ang mga open codes ninyo para lumaki yung inyong uh, concept. Tapos mula sa mga malalaking concept na to, mamimili kayo ng mga iba't ibang konsepto na doon nag-gravitate ang ideas behind the object of your study. Tapos gagawa kayo ng conditional matrix. Ang conditional matrix ay gumagawa na kayo ng mga mga iba't ibang klase ng pagkakaugnay-ugnay. No, na ito at ito ay ganito ang ugnayan nila, ito at ito ay iba naman ang ugnayan, kaya meron tayong conditional matrix at lalabas ang grounded theory pag naayos natin silang lahat. At meron din pong paliwanag na kung gusto nyong mabasa ay makita ninyo sa source na babanggitin po mamaya. Yan. So makita nyo ang conditional matrix, isa po itong pamamaraan para i-analyze ninyo further ang grounded theory para umabot kayo sa iba't ibang levels ng value at explanation no minsan umaabot pa sa international level so hindi po siya isang way na paggawa ng teorya isa po siyang pamamaraan ng pag-explain or pagpapaliwanag na isinama ni nila Strauss sa kanilang grounded theory ang constructivist naman po gagamit din siya ng open coding pero irerefocus niya kasi makikita niya na merong mga code na medyo mas mahalaga doon sa iba at kapag nakita na niya yung mas mahalaga, makita na niya yung mga relasyon ng mga mas mahalagang code na ito, gagawa siya ng grounded theory. Ang kaibahan lang nito doon sa classical, mas open ito sa interpretasyon ng researcher, walang assumption nito ng tabula rasa or paglapit sa tabula rasa. Ito ay completely according to interpretivist uh, parameters. Ayan, ito po yung mga paliwanag na kung gusto nyong basahin ay makikita nyo sa ating source na ito. Okay? So overall, mahalaga po sa grounded theory ang continuous uh, uh, reference to our initial code, to actual codes, to selected codes. No? Paikot-ikot po yan, iterative ang process. Na, medyo nakakapagod siya. Kung hindi po kayo uh, oriented sa pagbabasa at paulit-ulit na pagbabasa para masigurado na ang code ninyo ay tugma doon sa idea ng mga narrative, medyo hindi po ito bagay sa inyo. So, kailangan ninyong unawain na requirement po siya, hindi siya option. No? Kaya reflexivity is a key discipline. No? And memoing, which is taking note of observations as you do a lot of reflection, is intrinsic in both classical, Straussian, and constructivist grounded theory. Okay, so uh, let's take let's step, uh, take a step backward. No, lalakyan natin ang ating pananaw. Um, kung titingnan niyo, meron pa yung research question, may theoretical sampling kayo. Isa saturate niyo yung ideas. Tapos uh, magdedata collection kayo. Um, clarification, makita nyo, data collection ang gamit niya, hindi data construction. No? So very positive is pa rin itong framework na ito. So magko-coding kayo para makarating sa concept. Magko-constant comparison, comparison kayo ng concept para makarating kayo sa category. Magsasaturate kayo ng category para makarating kayo sa teorya. No? Magmo-model hanggang theoretical model. So uh, makita nyo may double arrows, no? kada box mula sa taas hanggang sa dulo. So, ibig sabihin, constant ang dialogue ninyo. No? Hindi kayo natatapos sa isang proseso. Balik-balik kayo niyan para masigurado na tama ang inyong coding. Kasi kung mali ang inyong coding, unreliable ang inyong data. And I'm using unreliable kasi merong pagka-positivist yung procedure na ito. Gusto niyang makasigurado na ang code ninyo ay talagang nakabatay doon sa katotohanan ng pinag-aaralan ninyo. At ito po yung mas malayong pananaw. Makikita ninyo na 
Uh, meron kayong data collection ulit. Data collection ang ginamit nila. Very positivist. At meron kayong paulit-ulit. Tinatanong tanong ninyo yung sarili ninyo uh, regarding the data and the research question. So hindi po siya linear. Na meron kayong research question, data collection, analysis. Hindi. Ulit-ulit. No? Iterative. Tapos every time kayo na mag-analyze, nagkakaroon kayo ng comparison no? sa mga konsepto, mga kategory at mga codes. So nagkakaroon ng joint coding at analysis. At kung, kung umabot na kayo, no? nag-saturate na yung categories ninyo, yun lang yung tamang panahon para magkaroon kayo ng teorya. No? Dangerous path po kasi yung pag-jump to theory from specific. Kaya ang ginagawa ng grounded theory, uh, very careful siya sa paggawa ng code kasi yun yung gagamitin mo sa theory. So ma maging maingat po tayo sa ating coding kaya minsan maganda talagang pag-aralan yung mga detalye ng pagkukod. No? Para sa mga nagko-qualitative research, yung coding ay parang thematic analysis. Pero ang grounded theory kasi, OC nga po siya. Kaya kailangan very clear tayo sa, sa mga pangalan natin, sa mga tema na ginagamit natin at every stage of processing. Ayan. So, dumating na tayo sa selection of the GT methodology. Bakit natin siya kailangan gamitin? Kailan? No? The selection of the methodology is always a difficult task for the researcher who must be aware of what is the relationship between the world thought of the researcher, the research, and the issue under investigation. So, hindi simple na ano po dapat ang gawin ko? Anong proseso? Walang one step, one, one, ano, one way, one, uh, one uh, size fits all na sagot dito. Kailangan nyo mag-dialogue sa sarili ninyo. At tulad ng sinabi, the world, the world thought of the researcher, yung tinitignan ninyo na gusto nyo pag-aralan, at yung ano yung, yung issue na gusto nyo tignan. So for the researcher, it is important to have a full understanding of the philosophy. So kung hindi po kayo well-grounded sa philosophy, I, I probably would advise you to be very careful about saying you're doing grounded theory kasi malilibak po siya kapag present nyo siya sa grounded theory conference. Kasi very OC po ang mga tao doon. And ang bilis-bilis ng mga tao na magsabi grounded theory siya. Pero kung titignan mo yung proseso, ay hindi niya sinundan yung proseso na nakaangkla sa iba't ibang klase ng grounded theory. So, um, stringent ang kanyang requirement. So, all researchers who consider grounded theory need to determine which type of grounded theory best suits their purpose. So, uh, kung grounded theory, sa grounded theory kayo na orient, kailangan tingnan nyo ano ba yung mas bagay. Baka mas constructivist to, hindi classical. Baka mas classical to, hindi siya Straussian. No? So, kailangan marunong kayong manimbang. So for the researcher, it is not about which method is superior. Kasi bawat isa sa kanila, may, may sense of legitimacy na, naman siya. Kasi dumaan yan sa pagtitimbang ng iba't ibang komunidad. No? It is more which one fits both the, the data and the researcher. So may binabagayan siya talaga. So it is important for those using CGT or the classical to focus on two aspects of grounded theory. The nature of the area of interest, so ontology, and the extent of the researcher's abilities, kaya mo bang tignan ang ontolohiya ng inyong gustong pag-aralan? Kasi kung hindi kayo nagtutugma, hindi kayo match, hindi nyo dapat gawin ang, ang grounded theory. Okay, so ano yung dapat ninyong tanungin sa sarili ninyo kung gagamit kayo ng, ng GT? Understand yourself and how you like to do research. Kung hindi kayo quantitative, uh, qualitative researcher, nagsisimula pa lang, wag to yung talunan ninyo kaagad. Mag-intermediate mag muna kayo. Kasi mas malaki yung requirement nito for narrative processing. Can you tolerate the lack of clarity at the beginning of the research journey? Sa positivist research po, very clear ang ating variables. Measurable na kagad siya. So kung dyan kayo nang gagaling at may interest kayo sa GT, hindi po mabilis na makakatalon kayo doon. Kailangan buksan ninyo yung isip ninyo na ang clarity ay hindi nandoon sa simula ng grounded theory. Take time to explore the details of various versions of grounded theory. Pag-aralan ninyo and constantly be aware of the signs of the me method slurring. Pag method slurring, nag-overlap sila. So kailangan nyo na talagang tingnan saan sila nagkaiba at saan sila nagkapareho para kung ipapaliwanag ninyo ang grounded theory sa inyong kapel at kung paano nyo siya ginawa, klaro sa inyo yung pagkakaiba-iba at pagkakapare-pareho nila. Pangatlo, 
approach the how to ground how to grounded theory books with a great deal of caution many speak the terms but do not walk the talk yun po yung sinasabi ko sa inyo na kung gusto niyo ng immediate na sagot at mayroong libro na sasabihin sa inyo ito yung be all and end all ito yung nag-iisang sagot diyan maging cautious po kayo kasi hindi ganoon siya kadali Manager fear that you will end up with lots of interview notes but no theory. So medyo nakakatakot pero kaya naman natin siyang i-manage. So kung gusto niyo siyang gawin, talaga very passionate kayo. Learn how to manage your anxieties. Okay? And then trust in the process but, but stay true to the course. So for those doing CGT or yung classical ni, ni Glasset, Caving in and doing the literature review prior to substantial development of your theory will likely derail a potentially good theory before. So kung hindi nyo alam ang pagkakaiba ng Straussian, ng constructivist at classical, at nagbabasa kayo sa simula bago nyo siya gawin, na pagdesisyonan ninyong gumawa ng GT pagkatapos yung pag magbasa ng pagkarami-raming literature, then medyo na-derail nyo na yung sarili nyo. So ganito pa lang, maganda na tinignan nyo na ang GT kasi kung may bala kayo, you will be very careful about doing literature review at the very beginning. So if a mentor can be identified, use him or her, but ensure that their philosophy is in tune with both the researcher and the research area. So very clear alignment is very important in grounded theory. Your paradigm, your approach, your design, your method should all align. If they don't align, get an expert, but the expert must know no, what kind of alignment is necessary to achieve no, the, the necessary requirement for grounded theory. And don't give up. I know there are many of us who are passionate to do grounded theory. Maganda po ang grounded theory kasi ito yung way para gumawa tayo ng teorya na naka-angkla sa kulturang Pilipino. Pero hindi po siya immediate ang satisfaction. Kailangan ng disiplina kasi ayaw din natin malibak ang teorya natin sa labas no ng ating bansa no kailangan maganda rin ang grounding niya kaya grounded theory is one way to start it's just one way hindi po siya yung natatangi no meron pang ibang paraan maaring meron ding iba sa atin na gustong magpasimula informed by the process of grounded theory but has the independence of thought and clarity of mind to to create its own direction when it comes to creating our own filipino theories no through uh, through the guidance of ground, grounded theory and linked to the previous point stay open and remember if you selected cgt it will generate a substantive theory maaring hindi kayo umabot sa formal theory na mas universal mas larger ang appeal pero definitely if you understand the context it will generate a theory that is applicable to that context or other similar contexts. So it's not a, a futile, no, a futile endeavor. Tapos if you're using CGT or the classical one, be cautious of software claiming it will aid in your analysis. It can act as a block and not an, an enabler. Ah, uh, marami po tayong magagamit na ano na software ngayon. Inaanalyze nila ang narrative. Makakatulong po siya. Pero I think if we're looking at context. Alis po muna tayo sa software kasi ang software hindi niya naintindihan ng context. Tao lang po ang nakakaunawa ng nuances sa bawat context. So kailangan po natin ng pasensya. So finally, keep referring back to the fit, understandability, generalizability, and control as put forward by Glasser and Strauss in 1967. Kung kailan sila nagsimula, nandun po yung pinaka-core principle. Kahit na naghiwalay sila, andun yung reaction nila sa positivism. At maunawaan natin lalo kung bakit tayo gagawa ng GT kapag naunawaan natin kung yung pangailangan na gumawa ng GT mula kay Glaser at kay Strauss. So the properties of fit, relevance, understandability, generality, control, workability, generalizability, and modifiability make Glaserian grounded theory and grounded action particularly well suited for studying systems okay so kapag mas complex okay mas maganda ang gt and of course uh, all of the questions that i presented to you na inexplain ko lang dinipen ko lang came from this particular source 
Uh, I just would like to give you examples of grounded theory na nagawa from where I came from. At alam ko yung storya. Okay? So ito po ay nanggaling kay uh, Dr. Y. Marie Medina, now the president of uh, College of the Holy Spirit. Tinignan niya yung competencies for successful leadership in Polinian Higher Education Institution. Wala pong gagawa ng teorya na yan. Yung mga tao lang na naloob, nasa loob ng Polinian Institution. Eh wala pang gumagawa from among the people within Polinian institutions in the country. So, isa pong magandang opening siya para gumawa ng teorya na substantive. Hindi po ito formal or mas malawak ang sako. No? So, ang kanya po ay modified na classical kasi ang ginawa niya, instead na mag-interview siya, meron siyang mga questionnaires. No? Mas open ang classical GT sa questionnaires. Okay, at ito yung model na ginawa, ni ginawa niya. Ito po yung core categories niya no? sa nasa gitna. Ang sumunod na grounded theory na nagawa ay yung the making of the successful Filipino nurse leaders. Um, ang, si, si Dr. Jennifer Olivar po ay ang dean ng College of Nursing sa St. Paul. Ginawa po niya ito kasi nakita niya na ang, ang Polinian sisters po ay well known for hospital management in the Philippines. Isa po itong um, prominent na ministry ng Polinian sisters or SPC sisters. Ngayon, nakita niya na karamihan ng mga nurses ngayon ay nanggaling mula sa mga educators na Polinian sa simula. Pero wala pang tumitingin kung paano nag-contribute ang training nila from Polinian sisters uh, to, to become a successful Filipino nurse leader. So yun po ang hugot ng study na to at ito po ang kanyang kanyang uh, model. No? Medyo crude lang po, mahirap kung gumawa, hindi siya designer na online, pero meron po siyang spiral na, na image sa gitna, meaning nag -e elevate po ang kanyang competency as challenges uh, rise. And then lastly, this is very recent, ito po ay integral old, older adult care model for an expanded Polinian older adult care home. Ang pinagmulan po nito ay ang mga SPC sisters po ay meron sa kanya-kanyang care home facilities. Kaya lang kukunti na sila. So noon, marami pa, puno pa yon. Pero ngayon, kukunti na lang, bakante na po at meron namang mga empleyado ang mga SPC institutions na mga single, wala ng pamilya, gusto nilang i-open ang facility para sa mga taong yon. Kaya lang, ang tanong namin is, pwede mo bang i-implement lang kung ano yung pre-practice nila noon para sa mga madre? Siyempre hindi. No? So, ano yung dapat nating gabay? Ano yung, ano yung teorya na dapat nating sundin para dito sa gagawin nilang intervention? No? Pagbukas nila ng elder care facility sa, sa kanilang institution. So, yan yung pinagmulan ng kanyang uh, study at ito ang kanyang substantive theory. So, meron siyang triad no, of, uh, for the elderly care uh, facility na bubuksan. So, sa bandang huli po, gusto ko lang linawin sa inyo na kung iniisip ninyo na gumawa ng grounded theory, kailangan nyo mag-dialogue sa tatlong klase ng P. Una yung paradigm. Saan ba kayo nakatungtong? Kayo po ba ay post-positivist? Kayo po ba ay interpretivist? Kayo po ba ay constructivist? Kung constructivist kayo, hindi kayo satisfied sa post-positivism. Klaro yun. No? Paninindigan po kasi itong paradigm. Merong iba na mas flexible, kaya nilang tumawid. Pero kung hindi kayo ganon, mas committed kayo sa isang pananaw, then definitely your paradigm will be a major factor in deciding what kind of GT you will do. Second, tingnan ninyo yung sarili ninyo. Kayo po ba ay merong kakayanan na maging reflexive? Yung patuloy na tumitingin sa sarili at sa prosesong dinadaanan ninyo. Kayo po ba ay mayroong conceptual complexity? Kaya nyo po bang magkaroon ng nuancing sa paggawa ng mga konsepto na ilalagay ninyo sa inyong data analysis? Or kayo po ba ay may disiplina? Kaya nyo i-manage ang rigor ng hinahanap ng GT? Kasi kung hindi, hindi kayo bagay sa GT. No? So itong tatlong ito ay dapat nyo pag-isipan para mapag na ninyo sino ba yung gagawa ng GT. No? At panghuli, ay by the way, bago dumating sa huli, meron nagsasabi na ang GT ay hindi para sa isang tao. No? Kailangan kayong gumawa ng isang team kasi dapat may magbalanse. I think this is classical GT. May balanse sa inyong pag-create uh, ng codes. No? And finally, tingnan ninyo ano yung pag-aaralan ninyo. 
meron ba mga contextual questions? Parang yung elder care facility, nag-iba na ba yung konteksto ng pag-aalaga sa mga matatanda? Kung ganun, baka iba na ang pamamaraan ng pag-aalaga sa matatanda. Yan ang contextual question. Moving target, nag-iiba, nagbabago ang teknolohiya bawat sitwasyon, bumibilis. So kung moving target ang tinitingnan natin, baka yung teorya nagwe-waver siya all the time depending on the situation. Kung ganun ang gusto ninyong pag-aralan, bagay po ang GT. Kasi context, theory, bagay sa konteksto. At ang bawat context ay nagbabago dahil moving ang target ninyo. And finally, meron po bang theoretical gap? Theoretical gap means meron po bang teorya na hindi na niya may paliwanag ang gusto niyong pag-aaral, no? pag-aralan. Kung ganun po ang sitwasyon, dapat kayong gumawa ng GT. Kasi kailangan kayong mag-provide ng alternative na theory para maunawaan natin lalo yung gusto ninyong pag-aralan. At kung pagsasamasamahin ninyo ito, makikita ninyo na hindi simpleng bagay ang pagtatanong or pagsagot sa tanong na ano po ba ang dapat nating gawin kapag interdisciplinary ang ating gustong pag-aralan. Medyo marami po tayong dapat suungin na tanong at dapat tignan natin kung bagay ba ang GT sa isang interdisciplinary na research. So salamat po. So sana ay marami po akong na itulong para mas maunawaan natin ang grounded theory. Thank you very much, Dr. Brian Bantugan, for a very, very comprehensive discussion. I'm sure na marami nang gustong mag-enroll po sa inyong klase. Lalong-lalo na because this is, this has to do with research and it's very important because, the, you know, we have to cultivate research also in our educational institutions. The floor is now open for questions. Um, this is from Jafet Nabaira. Good day. Since we are generating a theory here, we cannot get rid of subjective interpretations. Is it included in the nature of this approach? If not, how are we going to handle this? Uh, sagutin ko. Um, kasi ang GT may iba't ibang level siya ng subjectivity. So ang subjectivity, binabalanse natin ng proseso, ng procedure. Kaya si Strauss, yung Strauss na grounded theory, gumawa siya ng disiplina na kailangan niyong sundin para yung paggawa ninyo ng teorya ay hindi basta-basta. May sunundan pa yung proseso. So that said, ninu-neutralize mo in some way yung subjectivity na nakakapasok sa proseso ng GT. Hindi po siya bawal. Kailangan lang may checks and balances. Kaya yun yung ginawa ni Strauss at ni Corbin. Ang constructivism po is another strand na wala siyang pakialam kung meron siyang subjectivity. Ang gusto niyang ipaliwanag is merong teorya na nakabatay lang sa interpretasyon at hindi siya invalido. Wala siyang kinalaman sa positivism. So wala siyang inaaway. Kanya lang yun. So depende po kung nasaan kayo. So definitely, meron pong objectivity ang classical GT pero hindi siya pure objectivism. No? Meron siyang level of subjectivism din. Pero so, nagsasubscribe siya na habang lumalapit ka sa objectivism, mas nagiging reliable. Pero that's just classical. So what I'm saying is, um, kung GT po at grounded theory ang approach natin para gumawa ng teorya, uh, buksan muna natin yung isip natin. Al sabihin natin sa sarili natin na hindi na dapat issue ang subjectivity. Pagbalanse na lang ng gaano, gaano ka ka-expansive ang subjectivity na ipapasok mo at ano yung checks and balances mo para makita mo rin na hindi lang ikaw, meron ding uh, external validity yung iyong teorya. At uh, ang GT po kasi is, kung titignan mo yung data, binavalidate na niya yung sarili niya, data pa lang. Yun yung kagandahan ng GT. So hindi mo na kailangan magpunta sa eksperto, tanungin mo, ito ba yun? Hindi. Ang sabi ng GT, kung mag-stick ka sa data, sa informasyon na makukuha mo, it will validate itself. No? So, ang tinitingnan natin, balansihin natin yung subjectivity ng researcher at tingnan din natin ang legitimacy ng datos natin na kukuha sa field. Okay, thank you. From the same, uh, uh, from the same questioner, yung si Jafet Nabaira, I can see in the process that is somehow iterative how do we know then that we have reached theoretical saturation? Ah, ito yung sinasabi natin na kapag nagko-coding kayo, makita nyo paulit-ulit doon sa transcript, merong 
merong umuulit-ulit, merong very related sa bawat isa. Alam niyo yung visual na word cloud? I'm sure nakita niyo na yon. So merong ganon, merong konsepto na kapag dumami na ang codes niyo, lumalaki na yung konsepto na yon, mas nagiging solid, nagki-crystallize ang category. So pag nag-crystallize na siya, sure ka na na medyo malapit-lapit ka na, no? Lumalaki na yung pag pagiging importante ng kategorya na yon, no? So so ulitin ko, from code, pag medyo merong mga pagkakapare-pareho umakyat kayo sa concept, di ba? Pag yung concept ninyo, meron nang mga nag-gravitate, nagiging category na siya. Kung nakita niyo na yung relationship, yun na. Nakita niyo na yung relationship ng mga categories ninyo, malapit na siya sa teorya. No? So, kailangan talaga ng disiplina at laging maingat sa pagko-code kasi kung mali ang pag-code mo, mahirap kang makarating doon sa saturation. At saka I think kailangan mo ring irespeto, may gut feel din tayo eh. Lalo na pag context. Merong mga bagay na makita mo sa papel, sa transcript. Pero kung hindi mo siya nakita ng interview, hindi mo malalaman yung lalim ng konteksto ng salita. So, pagbalansi siya ng coding mo, ng transcript, at nung, nung pangdama mo. Yan yung I think kailangan nating uh, isolidify as a method in, in uh, Filipino research. Yung, yung gut feel. No? Yung pakiki, kasi yung pakikisalamuhan natin, nag enhance yan ng gut feel gut feel sa, pa, sa research. So I think wala niya ng West. So I think dapat tingnan natin paano siya nag-contribute sa pag-crystallize ng teorya. Okay, thank you, Dr. Brian. We have a question from Dr. V Vicente Handa, Doc Vic. Opo. Oh, would you mind? I, can, I will just ask a uh, uh, question directly to Dr. Uh, Bantugan. Uh, thank you, uh, Doc Brian, for your, for orienting us about grounded theory, locating it from the time of uh, Strauss and Corbin, and then uh, Blazer and Strauss, and then Strauss and Corbin, and then later on to that of Charmas and other contemporary authors like Pedjon and Henbo. I'm just curious of the contemporary stand of Strauss, as well as uh, Glaser, if they still stick in terms of their ideas and grounding grounded theory to the post-positivist paradigm, or are they moving towards uh, the interpretivist uh, grounding of grounded theory, considering that uh, their ideas were made or were written in the 1960s, and there are so many changes that happen epistemologically and theoretically about the nature of knowledge since then. So I'm curious if they are still that hardcore to their post-positivist paradigm or they have shifted already to a more contemporary viewpoints with respect to uh, grounded theory. Because I see that it seems like nowadays, if we are going to go to classical, uh, based from your example, for example, I see the, the inclusion already of quantitative research methodologies or methods that uh, if look from the contemporary perspective, it seems that this is already a misalignment to, to an interpretivist way of looking at grounded theory because of course, the use of quantitative data sources are still leaning towards the very origin of all this all conversation which is positivism. So I'm thinking, what are your thoughts about this issue, sir? Thank uh, you. I think mas madali siyang sagutin kung titignan natin yung continuum of interpretivism. Kasi uh, yung interpretivism, pag lang, lagpas niya ng positivist, ang, ang sumundot dyan, o yung pinagsimulan niya, ay meron pa beyond the positivism. So doon nagsimula si, si Glaser at si, si Strauss. No? They, they believe together that there might there should be some other way of creating theory out of just the positivist realm or process. So that's the, the, the first end. On the second, na lumalabas tayo, humiwalay si Strauss, kasi sabi niya, baka wala naman talagang dapat masyadong emphasis on positivism. Ang kailangan natin, i-guarantee lang natin na itong mga datos natin, not basically interpretations of reality, 
ay meron siyang foundation in reality. Reflection siya ng nangyayari doon. So nagmi-mirror siya. So that said, I think connected pa si si um, Glasser at si Strauss doon sa pinagugutan nila. Pero definitely, if you look at the history, meron na rin silang dialogue sa nangyayari sa paligid. No? Kaya yung classical, yung classical na GT ay hiwalay si Strauss. Kung tutusin, magkasama sila. Pero ang emphasis kasi ni, ni Glasser ay yung jump, jump to theory from, from the data at the moment. Pero klaro na post-positivist to. Open siya sa quantity at qualitative data. So, nagdadayo. So, siya pinaka-social scientist, if you may say so, na very empirical ang orientation. That's Glasser. Pero uh, within the continuum of interpretivism, lumabas na si Strauss. Si Strauss naman, while interpretivist siya, ayaw niyang humiwalay doon sa pinanggalingan niyang positivism. Kaya parang nililegitimize niya ang kanyang pag-process ng data through the step-by-step -step process. So, I don't think hiwalay sila completely. Nag-venture nag, nag out lang sila kasi iba yung paraan nila ng pag-legitimize ng kanilang positivism by carrying their own interpretivist orientation within them. So, I don't know if I answered your question, pero I don't think they stayed there. I think they ventured yeah, yeah. out. Uh -huh. hmm. Isa na lang, Doc Brian, ah. kasi sa contemporary na viewpoints sa uh, grounded theory, like there are some researchers who might be grounded their work on the classical grounded theory or that of Strauss. So most likely, ang critique sa kanila, most especially if they're going to use uh, quantitative research methods like survey, most often siguro ito ma-met ng mga researchers on grounded theory kung nasa classical ang kanilang grounding ay that's a quantitative method and uh, it doesn't fit with uh, with uh, an interpretivist uh, notion of what is considered as knowledge. So they, they might say they were critic the method as there's something wrong with the method because uh, that's quantitative. It's not aligned to the epistemology or possibly theoretical research perspective of if they are going to use the interpretivist uh, theoretical research perspective, particularly symbolic interactionism. So what, what, what are your thoughts about that, Dr. Ventugan? I think yung danger kasi is when one strand tries to judge the other. Parang ganon, mm -hmm. when the apple says, you're not an apple. Kasi hindi naman siya talaga apple, although puro pruta sila. So I think the idea is, parang there's, there's, I think there should be no debate on which is the best one. I think there should be a discussion on which particular strand is better for a specific phenomenon. I think that's where we should contribute discussions on. Where, where, kasi hindi natin pwedeng ipilit na mag-constructivism yung si, ano eh, si Glaser eh. Hindi niya, hindi niya yon paradigm as a researcher. No? So, I think we should all uh, consider the fact that whatever it is that you carry as a paradigm must resonate with the paradigm of the person uh, uh, advocating for a specific strand of GT. Kasi hindi talaga, it would be unfair, uh, for me ha, it would be unfair to just say wala nang value yung post-positivism kasi ang pinaka-in na ngayon ay interpretivism. I don't think from the point of view of constructivism that's healthy. So I think mm. ang, ang, ang magiging uh, conflicting for us researchers would be to say there's only one best GT. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, it seems, Dr. Bantuga, na even within grounded theory, the way I look at it, the paradigm wars still existing, it seems, even the methodology of grounded theory, if that's the case. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Dear. Okay, thank you. We have another question from Dr. Randy Nobleza. Hello, Dr. Bantugan. Hello. Ang concern ko po ay ang pagtuturo ng pananaliksik sa undergrad at graduate level. Paano po ang pinakamainam na paraan para ipakilala sa mga bata na galing sa K-12 uh, na sistema na hindi na masyadong mahalaga ang proseso kundi mas may bigat ang produkto? Uh, uh, I can relate with that question. <laughs> Nihirapan ako na, pag, na, na, na utusan din ako magturo ng 
practical research one para sa mga bata. At yung research approach ay may kasamang GP. Na kung alam mo ang requirement ng GP, medyo hindi mo dapat siya <laughs> in-expect sa undergrad, lalo na sa senior high. Although, pwede mo siyang ma may pa-appreciate. Okay? I think the goal for including GP in senior high school is that later on, pag nag-graduate studies yung mga bata na yan, merong napakatalino dyan sa bata na yan. Alam na niya ang GP. nag advance reading na siya at nakita niya, uy, exciting to. Kasi meron ganun bata eh, meron siyang sariling inquisitive nature na hindi mo dapat pigilin sa senior high school. Dapat i-open mo siya. So ano yung ginawa ko? Ginawa ko is, ano ba yung basic skill for GP na kailangan mong makuha without taking them to the philosophical expanse of that discipline or, or research? Una, interviewing skills. Kailangan ka makinig. Okay? Kailangan mo i-transcribe. Yun. So, yung disiplina ng transcription, yung disiplina ng pakikinig, yung disiplina ng pag-interview, kailangan nilang makuha kasi regardless of the approach, ang interview is very critical. It can be used as a method in any research approach. Tapos, sabihin mo sa kanila na ang thematic analysis na very basic is the stepping stone towards the next level of analysis for codes and concepts and categories and then later on sa theory. And you have, you have to warn them also na hindi basta bigla-biglaan na, oh, magkakarelate sila, ito na yon core category na siya. Hindi ganon. So I think if you want to, to uh, educate senior high school students on grounded theory, you have to let them appreciate it. You have to open them to the skills required for GP so they can prepare early on their own if they want to. And then number three, you have to make them cautious that it's unfair, it's... Uh, and scholarly to make immediate jump from from codes pa lang they generated theory hindi pwede yon you have to tell that's wrong yung yung ganun para makita rin nila na there is a complexity in the way you do research and if you want to really do it well you have to really be very conscious about nuancing and layers of interpretation and clustering of information i think yun yung mas mahalaga i don't think maka ma appreciate nila yung kabuuan ng GT. No? But I think you, introduce, you should introduce it at some point in senior high, but it should not be the core. I don't think that should be the core. Okay, thank you, Dr. Brian. Oh, so much time. We need to really discuss some more about this. A research is a never-ending process and discussion, but we have to uh, move now to the awarding of the Certificate of Appreciation. Thank you, Dr. Brian Bantugan, for, for helping uh, us understand um, the basics and the procedures of grounded theory. Um, Office of the President, Republic of the Philippines, National Commission for Culture and the Arts presents the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Brian S. Bantugan for his uh, ang liit valuable input as guest speaker lecturer for the 2020 NCCA Research Colloquium, Sali Cultura Research Methodologies, given the second day of October 2020 via Zoom, in celebration of the 2020 Research Grants Colloquium, signed by Al Ryan S. Alejandre, Executive Director of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts. Thank you, Dr. Brian. Maraming salamat din po, Dr. Hope. Thank you. As we approach the close of our program, may I remind the participants to accomplish their evaluation forms. The link is provided in the chat box. This is also to ensure that you will receive your electronic certificates of participation. And what conference will not be complete without the photo ops? So please stay after the closing remarks and turn on your videos so that we can capture you on screen. We can see each other. Sayang, hindi tayo pwede mag-jump shot, no? May I now call on our colleague, who is the Commissioner for the Subcommission on Cultural Dissemination, the eminent scholar, Dr. Vic Vicente Handa, head of the Technical Working Group for Research, for his closing remarks. Okay, put it turned on. Okay, okay see. The video. Okay. Uh, thank you, Doc Hope. 
thank you also to our speakers, Dr. Mirano, Dr. Bantugan, and to the panel of presenters. Uh, I would like to begin my, my closing remark by telling an ancient Buddhist parable. A group of blind men heard that a strange animal called an elephant had been brought to the town, but none of them were aware of its shape and form. Out of curiosity, they said, we must inspect and know it by touch of which we are capable. So they sought it out, and when they found it, they groped about it. The first person whose hand landed on the trunk said, this being is like a fixed thing. For another one whose hand beats its ear, it seemed like a kind of fan. As for another person whose hand was upon its leg said, the elephant is a pillar like a tree trunk. The blind man who placed his hand upon its side said, the elephant is a ball. Another who felt its tail described it as a rope. And the last felt its tusk, stating the elephant is that which is hard, smooth, and like a spear. I think this parable is very consistent to what we are discussing very recently and the many issues raised with respect to how to do cultural studies research. Sali kultura, paano nga ba i-research ang kultura ng Filipino? Should research knowledge be an objective representation of a Filipino culture? Can researchers draw objective knowledge about culture and objectively represent this knowledge? If your answer is yes, then you as a researcher might be studying the Filipino culture using the epistemological sense of objectivism and the theoretical research perspective of positivism and the critique to it within objectivism, which is post-positivism. Do you believe that any knowledge we have right now about the Filipino culture are simply product of human interpretations of the social and the physical world via social interactions? And I think this were the focus of Dr. Mirano and Dr. Bantugan's talk. And that no cultural knowledge exists outside an individual and social construction, thereby challenging the notion of objectivity in research. If so, you might be an interpretivist researcher holding an epistemological stance of constructionism and possibly operating under one of these lenses like symbolic interactionism, phenomenology, or hermeneutics. Do you believe that all dominant knowledge we have right now about the Filipino culture are grand narratives shaped primarily by power and by privileged positions and that research about the Filipino culture should continuously question and challenge its status quo in order to give way to voices coming from marginal spaces and that research should be used to construct the grand narratives and emancipate certain sectors of our society, then you are neither an objective nor an interpretivist slash constructionist researcher. You hold an epistemology of subjectivism, positively operate, possibly operating in one or more of these lenses, like critical theory, critical race theory, feminism, post-colonialism, queer theory, post-structuralism, postmodernism, among many others. Now the big question might be, which of these epistemological stances and lenses is correct? And I think Dr. Bantugan addressed that question, not to privilege one lens or one epistemology. The moment one says, this is the only way and the correct way of doing cultural research, I think that is the end of the discourse. Tapos na ang usapan. The moment we place one epistemological stance over and above other epistemological stances, we shut down the other ways of knowing and lose voluble cultural knowledge of the country. So we at NCCA, particularly at the TWG for Research program, 
would like to open various pathways to cultural knowledge production via research. What is the correct knowledge? Through this Sali Cultura, we open the discourse to what is considered as research of and about Filipino culture, and there is no closure yet to the humanity-old epistemological question. So marami pa tayong pag-usapan dahil wala pang closure dyan, and I think we, we are invited to this discourse of what is considered as Filipino cultural knowledge. The TWG for Research Program of the NCCA is and will continue to journey with you in our search of the country's cultural knowledge, of cultural knowledge of, about, and for the Filipinos. Various doors are opened, and we invite you to journey with us through this current and those succeeding colloquiums. Please join with us every Friday morning of this month. Have a great day ahead. Day ahead. Mabuhay tayong lahat. Naka-mute po kayo, Doc Hope, I think naka -mute. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vicente Handa, for the closing remarks. Actually, we have so many questions that have come in yet. Uh, you can email Dr. Brian Bantugan because these questions are very important. For instance, paano ba ang coding ko ang data mo ay hindi lang kung anong sinasabi, kundi ang paraan ng pagsabi. This is from Doc Jazliana, but since... We, we are running out of time. Uh, please email Dr. Bantugan. And don't forget, uh, please grab a quick lunch because we have another activity this afternoon. We have two acti NCCA activities. One is the National Artist Series for Literature, Davao Reads Amado Hernandez, which starts at 1 o'clock. And we have the Padayon Program of NCCA. Yun, masaya din yun kasi may mga dancing, may mga ibang-ibang uh, sharing ng cultures. So on behalf of the NCCA, we would like to thank our speakers and you, our participants, for your participation in making this first episode of the 2020 Research Colloquium a success. We hope to see you again in the next week's episode. So mark your calendars right now, October 9 at 9 a.m. and your evaluation form so you get your electronic certificates.